office email is full of a lot of fluff. I, I know the administration would like to hear this, but there's a lot of unnecessary gunk <laughs> every day. And uh, I know there is also on uh, AOL, but I have a high filter for um, spam. So um, it's much easier for me to see. But please, when you do that, whichever email you send me, but especially if you want me to send an attachment to you because you missed one of the handouts, there will be about three more after this week or four more before the um, um, midterm. Uh, if you need me to do that, please for sure send me the request on AOL because sometimes on the Outlook, it's what our campus faculty email system is called Outlook. It's bulky, it's cumbersome, it's slow. And about uh, half the time I can't do an attachment. And so then I have to ask you to re-email me again, which is a waste of everyone's time, on my uh, markw at aol.com. Okay, anybody need me to repeat any of that? It's pretty much just straight shop stuff, but we did need to go over it. Okay, um, if there's, is there anyone here, let me ask, is there anyone here for the first time tonight who uh, joined us recently, like in the last one day or so. I've been trying to keep up with that. Every day I've checked except one day this weekend. My email on both uh, AOL and uh, campus faculty email. Who hasn't yet gotten the handouts? I haven't. Which one? Oh, I sent, I think I sent, is that Ava? Yeah, I just emailed you like probably. Yeah, well then I will check it. Not tonight, it'll be too late, it'll be 10. We're all gonna wanna <laughs> you know, chill out tonight, but tomorrow I will send those. However, for t tonight, uh, you, you'll be able to take uh, uh, notes pretty easily without missing a beat because we start slow, only four slides. I will repeat the title and, you know, the date and that um, and the spelling Okay. for everyone, just to help you out. But you do want to get those, you know, printed out as soon as you can. Okay. Are there any other questions? Oh, extra credit. I have gotten some very good artwork from about a dozen people in each class. And that, I wanted to say that about the mini bios, I found them, you know, sometimes they're pretty much just, you know, okay, I worked here and I haven't traveled much. But this group uh, and the other Wednesday night class, I don't know, maybe it's the Zoom quality, uh, you know, uh, format that we're in, but uh, there were there were much more varieties of, of experiences and backgrounds and, and uh, interest as well as um, some rather well-written, I mean, actually well-written, and that's a good sign that you hopefully will apply those skills to your papers when they're due, and I'll help you with that process starting next week. In fact, at the start of class next week, you will need to take, and I'll send you an email to remind you, your uh, fifth hey. handout. That's the one that I sent just in the last, uh, oh, someone else wants to join. Okay. Uh, so I can talk while I'm doing that. <laughs> anyway, the point is that you'll have a, a, another handout that you can um, just uh, pull up like we're going to do tonight with nine elements. And that'll be the five, five requirements for your short papers. And you'll have a sample that will be sent as a PDF. It's like seven pages, including the, the illustration of the artwork from an A student from a recent class, you know, a few years ago. And you'll see how to, to do your paper. I think you'll see it by the end of the third week, you'll have a clear concept of how to do the papers. And they're not killer papers. They're two to five pages of short research, but I can help. <laughs> Any questions? Anybody? I thought I heard someone. Nope. Okay. Because we'll get to all that in more detail next week. So we'll just hold off on questions about the paper for now. But extra credit, it's an easy one when, for instance, you find any article about art and you send me it as an attachment or in a, you know, a screenshot or a PDF, whatever works for you, but hopefully something I can open, uh, or, or your own artwork. And again, in those formats, it's easiest if you can convert anything into a PDF because I saw some very talented, uh, art, you know, skilled artwork. Uh, and it's interesting and that's worth five points every time you do that or send an article. And then there are the the other options, you know, which I'll briefly mention, especially if there's a few people here for the first time tonight, and then we'll get to this topic behind me here, the nine elements of composition in just a minute. But the other options are for you to um, watch a movie about the life of an artist. It could be any artist that interests you, whether they're alive or dead or, or famous or not, but it needs to be at least 60 minutes. It can be either a feature movie or um, a, uh, a documentary of at least 60 minutes about any artist that you want to know more about 
and then write two pages about what you learned about that artist's life and their work, because the two overlap and relate to, obviously, their lives, artists' lives affect what kind of work they do. We're going to talk about some of that, but not till toward the end of this class, because we don't get past the beginning of the Renaissance here. But you're free to write a paper about any work of art from any period of any artist or any style or culture that you choose. It doesn't have to be something from the syllabus or from the periods we cover in this class. Okay. And then the final option is to either uh, well, download, uh, order and download either of the two art related novels that I have had for now two years, I guess they've been on Amazon or one of them has. Uh, the, it's just on the course policies, but some of you said you didn't get it yet. Uh, that handout from last week, the grading policy handout. The open house murders, that's a murder mystery, but it's not just that, it also has a heavy architecture component and there are sites on that where you can go, and that's one of the other extra credit options just to round out the list, where you can go take pictures of four views of the exterior of any building or site, interesting enough for you to want to get four different shots. It can't be a Costco warehouse, that wouldn't work, but a church, a house, a landmark, a mosque, a synagogue, whatever interests you. And then uh, send those to me as an attachment and you get 10 points for that. Well, the uh, Open House Murders novel I wrote set in 1991 during the end of the Cold War with the Russian mafia. And it's also got a love story. So it's, it's a multiple uh, dimensional storyline. But the main thing that I focused on was historic sites that are all around us, all over the Bay Area from Monterey up to the North Bay that you can go see and, and learn something about, maybe write one of your papers about and or just take photos and get extra credit. The other one is uh, Southside Story and that's the one that's got the most response. It's uh, over 48, I think it is, reviews now. And it's about a life uh, growing up with um, starving artists. That's what my parents were. But many of you know what that's like. Some of you yourself are now or have been through that. And also uh, being uh, you know old enough, it's coming of age is the phrase they use to understand what was happening during the early civil rights movement, the periods of the 60s and set in Chicago, and also issues of immigration, multicultural romantic relationships. It's, uh, it's gotten good reviews, but in case you can ignore those, you don't need to even think about them. But if you want to do that, if you download and show me the last chapter of either one of those, it's 15 points extra credit whether you read it or not, but I assume you, you know, might think about it. You have the whole semester. If you choose to read it and, and post a review, it doesn't have to be more than two sentences. That's another 10 points. Okay, plenty of things uh, all at once. So any questions about anything relating to anything I just said before we start this part of the uh, lecture? Okay, so I am now going to try and get this to be, here's the only problem is I have not yet had anybody explain to me how to get the view of the board behind me large enough for me to see the detail while I write on it. So I'm gonna try this. No, I don't want to stop the video. Why is it doing that? Yeah, there are a few functions on this that I haven't mastered. I mean, this is my first uh, for many of you too. Okay, well, Let's see, speaker view, let's try that, that might do it. Hmm, now why did it go to someone who's not speaking? <laughs> Glad to see you, I have no, no objection to seeing people, uh, you know, on this, but it isn't what, okay, I think we still have one more person to admit here. Okay, uh, I'm gonna try this one more thing, and then if not, I'm just gonna have to look at the board, but I can promise it. Now, if I do accidentally interfere with your line of vision for any of these specific elements, these nine different topics we're gonna discuss, ho holler, well, holler, you know, tell me and I'll step back because I think I've learned from practice to avoid doing that. Okay, I'm gonna try one other thing here. Um, I think, yeah, there we go. That worked. That worked. Okay. Now I should be out of your vision, your line of vision, and you should be able to see the board. Now I know I'm not unaware of the fact, my wife and I talked about this last night, that there's a little bit of a reflection down here. Well, I don't know where it is on there. There it is. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah. Believe me, we improved because it was right across the middle of the whole bottom three lines or so. So we've adjusted the height of the whiteboard and uh, the platform, this footstool I placed my laptop on. I've done everything I can to get it to where that shouldn't bother you too much. Okay, 
uh, because it's below all the text and drawings. All right, so now I'm out of everyone's line of sight, right? So you should now be looking at your handouts, which are the nine elements of composition. And another way of saying that, and I have my trusty homemade pointer that uh, I think it was my wife, might have been my daughter, uh, sharpened for me. So <laughs> formal analysis. Now that's an important phrase because when you write your short art research papers, you will need to divide them into the two main categories. We've already, if you were here last week, you know this. That's how you should take your notes too. If you weren't here last week, I will repeat that when we start the, the slide lecture portion after the break. But you should have subheadings, two major types of analysis of art that we'll use in this class. And those are also the, the same methods you should use for your papers. So this is another way of saying the nine elements of composition is formal analysis. In other words, what techniques did the artist use or does an artist use to create two-dimensional or three-dimensional works of art? Okay, so let's start with the first one, balance. Now, I'm not sure, there it is, yeah, good. All right, and I'm not, just part of my hands there, so you can read it, right? Balance, what does that mean? Well, when you have your nine elements of composition, you probably know that that is when you're looking at a particular work of art. Let's take it two-dimensional work, and that's why I drew this this grid here, because that's the easiest way to start. I'm going to go ahead and tell you that obviously we can't cover every potential subcategory or type of, of art that fits into these nine elements. And some works of art, such as an abstract painting, you know, some of you know who Jackson Pollock was, right? He didn't use all nine elements of, of composition or many other modern artists don't use some of these. And you might write a paper about an abstract painting or sculpture. So these apply only in certain cases, depending on what work of art we're analyzing or that you're writing about. Uh, but I want you to know how to describe all nine elements. And then if, when you're writing your papers, if you have some work of art that doesn't use any one or more of these nine techniques, so I'll repeat this, you don't just ignore it or you get points off because you didn't address that element. You'd say this artist chose not to use whatever, simulated texture or, or any of these other techniques uh, dur during their, you know, in, in this, I'm sorry, in this composition. So you do need to write a sentence that addresses all nine elements, whether they're present or not. Okay, any questions on that? All right, back to the first one. Balance is when you look at a, a work of art and you ask yourself, are there the same or roughly the same number of objects or areas covered by objects from top to bottom and from left to right. Well, how can you tell that? Uh, you Sometimes you can tell by just looking if the work of art is very simple and, and strictly realistic. It, it might just be some kind of engraving or a graph of black and white print. But most works of art are more complex, especially, you know, colored works and, and paintings. So how can you analyze whether they're balanced or not? Well, here's what you would do. This is all from Sarah Gill's book, which if you don't have, you should definitely try to get before the end of next week, at least. Uh, you don't have to uh, worry about being tested on any part of that book. I used to do that, but I don't anymore. But the elements come from that book. And they also, somebody's dog's barking. I don't think it's mine. <laughs> Every time anyone shows up at the porch, we, you may hear her bark. Uh, anyway, so what we have is these illustrations are my own version of what Dr. Sarah Gill put in her book. So if you're reading it, you know that. And if you don't have it yet, try to get it because you, it'll help you understand even in more detail. Because it's a book, so it can go into more depth than we have time for. Okay, so let's get back to how do we analyze whether work of art is balanced. Well, do this first. Draw an imaginary grid. First, outline it, of course. To create a grid, you have to have a border and then divide it into four equal sections or quadrants. I've done that with my uh, trusty little magic marker here. Okay, so let's say you're looking at a painting. We'll call this jellyfish. A painting of jellyfish is not likely you'll ever see any, but perhaps. So we'll just, because it's an easy way to uh, describe this technique. All right, so if the painting looked like this, the way I drew this that you see now on the whiteboard, and there's 
what one, two, three, four, right? Objects, specifically jellyfish, which I say objects above the middle. And how many below? One, two, three, four. Well, then by definition, this work of art is balanced from top to bottom. And if you're writing about it in your paper, you would say that. You'd say, this is a balanced painting because it has the same number of objects, or you could be specific and say jellyfish, above the middle and below. What about left to right? Well, obviously I'm starting out with the simplest possible explanation or example, I mean. Okay, same thing. There's one, two, three, four on the uh, right half and on the left half, the same number. Now, they might be slightly longer or larger, but if they're roughly the same, close to being the same size, and the numbers are the same, then you can say, once again, you'd write it in your papers this way. This work of art is also, you could say roughly or, or just balance is fine, is balanced from left to right as well as top to bottom, because you have to say why, if you want an A, you have to say what examples you're using to decide if something is balanced. Uh, it's the same for all these elements. It, you just need to give me two sentences is what I usually tell students who want to get an A on their papers for each of these elements to describe where you see them in that work of art and how they apply. Okay, so once again, your second sentence here about balance, if this was what you were writing about, would be to say that this work is also balanced left to right because there is an equal number of objects on either side left to right. It's pretty straightforward, I think, right? But let's take a look and see what would happen. I hope this doesn't, shouldn't fall down. <laughs> Had a hard time getting it to balance, but there it is. Okay, let's say that, uh, yeah, I gotta do this the right way. Okay, without messing up the border here. Okay, now, is it balanced top to bottom? No. No, because, yeah, uh, you get the idea. I don't wanna get too, uh, you know, bogged down in any one of these elements, but I just want to give you a couple examples. Yeah, because now you've got four, or you could just say more objects. You don't have to be specific how many below the middle than there are above it. More objects on the bottom half, but here's how to write that. So if you're taking notes, you want to add this, uh, that you would say this work now, right, the way it is, just as I changed it or altered it, is unbalanced or weighted, you can say it either way, weighted or unbalanced toward the bottom, comma, because there are more objects below the middle. And then uh, if you were to do this, okay, uh, and end up with, let's see. Now it's a little less obvious, but if you look carefully, you can see there are three objects above and below, right? Uh, the median, so it's yeah. balanced top to bottom again, right? Uh, but if you were to erase this one, of course, you would end up now having a work of art that is unbalanced again toward the bottom. And the second sentence would say also is unbalanced towards the right because there are more objects on the right. Okay, I think you guys get the idea. Any questions? This is, I, I don't think you have to worry about, in fact, don't even concern yourself about the order in which you choose to analyze all nine elements. The point is to cover all nine of them if you want an A and give examples of where you see each one. You'll see this in the sample paper that I'll be sending you before our next class when we go over how to write the papers. It's pretty straightforward that to cover things, uh, you know, thoroughly enough to get a good grade, usually two sentences is enough. Uh, it could be more if you choose to write more, but two is a good minimum of uh, explanation for where you see each of these elements. Okay, so we're starting off slow. This order might be, I think it is different than the handout I gave you, but it doesn't matter. You just can use that handout, if I were you, just a word to the wise, as a checklist for your own papers and say, did I miss one of these items or did I not adequately de describe them? All right, stable versus dynamic. All right, that one is also pretty easy. I always like to start out with the le least complex elements and work up to the more complicated ones when we get to the bottom with space techniques. Those are much more uh, sophisticated and, and complex. Okay, but for now, let's do number two as it is on this list. Stable versus dynamic, what does that mean? 
Okay, so if you see two or more curved and or diagonal lines, I'll say it again, the presence of two or more curved and or, uh, sorry, I started, <laughs> started off fine, I'll repeat that. If you, the presence of two or more curved and or diagonal lines in a work of art makes that work of art dynamic. We covered this last week for those of you who were at the first lecture when we saw the image of the Libyan Sybil, right, by Michelangelo. Uh, she was twisting and turning as she was lifting a book and the book's cover was off in two diagonals, you know, the, the, the pages weren't flat. So almost everything in that uh, painting was dynamic because of all the curved and diagonal lines. So what's the opposite of dynamic? Stable. That's when there are straight lines and or right angles in a work of art. But of course, most of you already have <coughs> thought this, I'm sure, before you took this class. Most works of art are not totally one or the other. They're mixtures where different parts of the painting or the drawing or the sculpture or even in build and supplies to buildings, uh, drawings, photos, paintings, uh, and sculpture, all five. Those are the five main categories of visual arts we're going to cover. In the, well, not photography because that's a 19th century invention, but you can write about photos if you want to on your papers. And so this applies to all the types of visual arts. Okay, so, so if something has, even a part of a painting, had straight lines, like the bottom of the painting of Michelangelo's um, uh, Libyan Sybil, where the Sybil was resting her toe on a giant wooden box, um, and that box had was square. So that box was a stable part of that painting, whereas almost everything around it, the figures, of, the two main figures of the baby angel and the Sybil, those were dynamic. I think that's pretty straightforward, and you can usually tell without having to get too analytical. And you oh, don't I have to give me more than two examples. So any questions? Let's stop now for a second. Somebody had a question? I have a question. Sure. So, so the painting for Michelangelo, Michelangelo, mm -hmm. they have dynamic and stable at the same time. Well, yes, different okay. parts of the painting. Most of the painting, like 90%, has curved lines, you know. Are dynamic. you looking at it now or did you, were you here last week? I, I was. Here, yeah, then I, you remember, yeah. Because yeah. her body and the baby angel next to her uh, and the book she was lifting with those diagonal book, you know, covers that it's like a giant volume of... <laughs> text right um th those are all curved and diagonal lines so that's the like the vast majority of that painting therefore you would say it is a mostly dynamic painting and then you'd say why because of where the curved lines are just you don't have to give two examples that's good enough on each oh, okay. but there are some uh, stable details uh and that would include the box that she's resting her foot on uh or the edges of the wall behind her okay is that Hopefully that clarifies. Yeah, R yeah. Rhythm is very. But I was thinking. Uh, go ahead. Think Sorry. One one painting can have both dynamic and stable. Yes, absolutely. That's what I was saying. Yeah, exactly. That's the point. Okay. Yeah. And most works of art do. Um, in fact, there are some that are totally one or the other. And again, I don't know how many of you have studied abstract painting. Um, it, it never was one of my favorite styles. My pa parents were realistic painters. They were expressionist painters. If you know what that is, some of you, early 1900s, uh, you know, about the time Picasso was going off into his abstract m m mood or mode, I should say. Uh, so uh, those kinds of paintings have both, you know, any painting that shows it, realistic objects in space, whether it's a landscape, a portrait, a group portrait, a cityscape, they're going to have some stable and some dynamic sections. But you take a Jackson Pollock painting, some of you know who he was, right? The guy that dripped his paint all over the canvas. There's not a straight line in any of his paintings. So his are entirely dynamic. You rarely see a work of art that's in totally stable because it's less interesting. Maybe that's the reason or just you know, the real world isn't all just straight lines right, and angles. So most uh, paintings, whether they're realistic or not, have at least some dynamic detail and usually at least some section that's stable. Okay. Any other questions? For now, okay, uh, rhythm. Number three in the list as I'm giving it to you, but again, it may not correspond to the number that's on your handouts. I don't have that in front of me. I, I did write the definitions down. Uh, 
on that handout, except for the techniques for space, because they're so complex. We'll get to that at the end of this half. All right, rhythm, it's not too complicated. Rhythm in a visual work of art, we're talking about, you know, uh, visual art, not performing art, like music. Rhythm and music, two different things. Rhythm in visual arts is the following. The presence are two of two or more of the same or similar shapes in any work of art creates rhythm. I'll say it again. The presence of two or more of the same or similar shapes in any work of art creates rhythm. So let's give you some easy uh, examples to, to visualize. There's no way I could draw all this on here. Um, <clears throat> even if I had the full size whiteboard at Santa Rosa JC, I just explained these things. So I've actually done the same amount of drawings on this whiteboard as I would have done in the classroom. So this work hopefully works for all of you as well as it would if we were there in person at uh, Annalee Hall. <laughs> Someday we'll get back there to the campus. Okay, rhythm. Uh, a good example is a group portrait. A bunch of people standing, you know, like sometimes the king and his queen and a family, you know, that was done in the Renaissance a lot and even well into the 1800s. Uh, famous painters were hired, you know, to be court painters, they called. And th then they would paint the royal family whenever the king or queen asked them to. So, so you would see, you know, a group of people standing across, you know, the, 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 the painting from left to right. And by definition, a painting like that, a group portrait of any kind, is going to have a lot of rhythm because it has the roughly similar shapes, uh, assuming that, well, even if they're children, they're still basically um, typically going to have <laughs> two arms, two legs, I started to say two heads. Well, that could be a problem. But anyway, <laughs> one head on each body. The human body is roughly the same shape, at least when you compare it to the optics around it in a group portrait. How about a landscape? Almost always there's, a, oh, I can't think of a landscape that doesn't, have, if it's a realistic landscape, that doesn't have rhythm, lots of it, because you're usually multiple objects like trees, multiple examples of trees which have roughly the same shape as the same species of trees or boulders and rocks along a you know country road uh, or people or or uh, you know horses or whatever uh, going along a path or a road or mountains in the distance behind maybe if it's a cityscape like a village or city with uh, towers from churches or, or mosques that are in the painting. Well, that by definition, those are roughly the same shape. They don't have to be exactly the same. So landscapes, whether they are, you know, unless they're ab totally abstract, uh, they're almost always going to have uh, multiple examples of similar shapes. So by definition, a landscape or a um, still life, you know, of fruit, unless there's not one single object on the table that's being painted in a still life that is anywhere near the same shape, that's rare. Most uh, still lifes are going to have repeated, you know, similar shapes, flowers, fruits, whatever it is, objects. Um, and so rhythm is a very common thing. What about a portrait of just one person, you know, like a bust of someone from their, uh, their chest up? Um, well, of course, that's got rhythm too. By definition, a portrait of any individual, whether it's a piece of sculpture or painting or drawing, or even a photo, is going to have rhythm because uh, typically, it's going to be uh, someone's face with two eyes, two ears, two lips, maybe their hair, possibly a part of their clothing is, is painted or, or shown that will have repeated shapes on, on their jacket or whatever they're wearing, their armor. So rhythm is very, very common in almost all works of art, including especially abstract paintings like the man I just mentioned, you know, if you know his work, Jackson Pollock's all about rhythm. He named his paintings rhythm number this, number that, because that's what they were. They were repeated uh, dribbles <laughs> of paint uh, in similar, you know, shapes all across. The, the, his campuses were like 18 feet long, some of them, yeah. So they were full of rhythm, okay? So rhythm is, is one of the most commonly signed, uh, sorry, seen uh, uh, items or, or elements of composition in any work of art. All you have to do is give me two examples. Um, That's simple, but let's go ahead with questions, please. Yeah. Uh, can the last supper could be... Oh, yes. That has a lot of rhythm because yeah. even though the, the people... Uh, you know about Da Vinci, right? Yeah. Yeah, the famous one, yeah. <laughs> and not the one done on velvet in someone's garage. No. Right? <laughs> no. <laughs> have you been to the original? Oh, it's breathtaking. 
I got to go there once with a tour guide. I was lucky because I had to wait two hours to get in and he had a special pass for, you know, American wow. journalists. Yeah, I, I had 15 minutes alone with him and the painting. And I have to admit, I was surprised they trusted him. Mean, of course, I didn't get used <laughs> to it. You're not supposed to get more than 15 feet away or less, I mean. Wow. Uh, uh, less than 50 feet away because your breath could damage it. Yeah, they have a rope that keeps you. But still, you can see it quite well, and I brought my binocular. Anyway, those are, everyone knows, right, that painting. Those are uh, 12 disciples plus Jesus in the middle. They're human beings with heads, shoulders, arms, even though they're all in different poses because it's a moment in which, supposedly, according to, uh, you know, th that scene in the Bible, right, is that Jesus announces he knows one of his disciples betrayed him to the Romans and he's going to be arrested. And there's pandemonium, you might say, shock in the room. So, yeah, there aren't exactly the same poses, but all of the figures you can see from roughly their waist up in that painting above the table top. Uh, mm -hmm. th that creates rhythm, plus the fruits and, and, and bread on the table and the windows in the wall of the building or room behind them. Yeah, lots of rhythm in any group portrait. Absolutely. Okay, any other questions on the uh, third one? All right, we're moving along at about the right pace here. Now this one, I'm gonna do one of my Mickey Mouse drawings and it won't take very long. Line. Line can be used in two main ways. It can be outline around the outer edge, like I did here, for instance, on this grid pattern. And if it's used as outline, it's almost always in most works of art, there's some thicker or bold. We say bold is a better word. Thick, you could use that word, but bold is a preferred term. And you'll see that in Sarah Gill's book on when the chat, each of these elements gets a whole chapter in her book in more detail. So bold or thick lines or thin, most works of art that you can see any outline around the objects have some which have thin outlines and some bold. So you just need to say where you see at least one or two examples of each, a bold outline or a thin or both. Some works of art only use thin and, and a few only use bold outlines. Michelangelo was pretty famous for using bold outlines in his close-up small group portraits of just the Holy Family, you know, Mary, Joseph, and Jesus, or, or, or portraits of people. Uh, he liked to use bold outlines. Sometimes he didn't use anything, but most artists use a little bit of both. So what's the other uh, technique that line can be used uh, for in a two-dimensional work of art. Well, let's do that now. Shading. And uh, so that's where you're creating a cross hatch effect. Now I'm going to have to hold this down so it doesn't wobble. And that is to create uh, the effect of some dark or area of shadow or darker areas. And when you do that, thickly enough or, or enough, you know, over and over, you create a solid area, of course, like I'm doing now, of a dark or shaded patch. And that's the use of line to create shading. And it's very common, especially in a Renaissance era engravings, which you might not be writing about, but some of you might. Anyway, so that's my best effort at illustrating. Shading uh, used as, you know, um, I mean, line, I'm sorry, line used as shading. Okay, but what about sculpture? What about Michelangelo's David? Again, I try to pick things that people have seen at some point in your life. You've all seen that. 16 and a half foot tall, also something to go see in, in a real, real life. It's just breathtaking. It's the largest piece of sculpture of a human figure ever carved out of a single piece of stone in the history of the human race that we know of. It's something was and ancient Egyptians used to carve statues that were bigger, but they weren't a single piece of stone. And we'll cover that when we get to Egypt. Yeah. Uh, I've been to Egypt, and you'll see some of my own slides of some pretty impressive pieces of sculpture in the desert that have been there for 3,000, 4,000 years. But they're not a single piece of stone. The pieces attached together uh, on top of each other. Th this was the largest David, the white marble sculpture, right? Uh, okay, we know that there is line on it. If you think about how else could, could he have made it? He used a chisel, of course, so the lines in the sculpture are carved lines, and that's what you would say. This work of art, whatever it is, let's say, Michelangelo's David that you're writing about, has multiple carved lines, for instance, around the eyes, uh, the mouth, uh, and, uh, you know, the ears, as well as maybe you might give one more example, like on the fingernails and toenails, or on the muscles uh, in his body, or his hair. Uh, those are carved lines. They're not painted or drawn like the ones I just mentioned for painting or, or drawing, but they're still lines. So you wouldn't want to say 
the type of line in a sculpture's car. Now, what about a building? Do buildings have lines? Yes, and I didn't write that here because I was running a little tight on space. I didn't want to get too many words into too many small, you know what I mean? It would have been confusing. So I'll just tell you now, if you're writing this uh, in your, at home, I assume you're at home, uh, in your own notes, you might want to write, in buildings, lines are usually visual lines, just like that word normally is spelled visual, right, with a V. Uh, in a building, lines are the corners or edges of a doorway, a window frame, or the actual corner of a building. So line is not actually drawn or carved in most buildings. Some buildings they are like, you know, county courthouses, okay, often have the name of the county or state capitol building or some even <clears throat> famous, uh, whatever, <laughs> hotels that begin with the letter T, whatever. You know, they might have a carved line outside the entrance to some buildings. Most modern buildings don't though. And so most buildings, if you're writing about in this class architecture, and some of you will for your papers or on the midterm and final, you, you could decide to write about lines, but then you would need to be very specific and say, there are no, uh, if there's no carved line, sometimes there is, and if there is, you say, there's a carved line with the name of the Pharaoh or whoever it is across the entrance or above the front doorway or something. But if it's just the edges of the building, that's called visual lines. So you say the only lines uh, uh, visible or, or noticeable in this building are the corners, which create visual lines and the, maybe the edges of the doorway. Most buildings just have visual line, but a few have carved. Rarely do they have also painted lines on the outside of buildings. Okay, so line again, I think these are uh, uh, the first few. I always start with these. They're pretty easy to visualize. Any questions about number four? All right, masses. This one I couldn't draw. Uh, well, I could. I could draw uh, an outline of King Kong, but there, I just didn't see any room here. Climbing the Empire State Building. Now, why in the world would that have anything to do with an art analysis? Well, here's what that has to do with. Masses is the relative size of various objects in a work of art or parts of those uh, objects. So I'll say it again. Masses is when you analyze the largest, right? All you have to give me is the three largest. That you should write because there wasn't room to write that. Uh, the three largest sections or, or parts of a work of art or the three largest objects. So any group painting is going to have, you know, uh, a group portrait is going to have people of different heights and sizes you know, weights, whatever, the mass of a person's body could vary. So you would look at that and say, well, the largest mass or volume is King Henry VIII. <laughs> Any painting he was in, he was usually the largest mass. <laughs> if you've ever seen portraits of Henry VIII, the, the, the monster that had six wives, right, and killed four of them. Anyway, the point is that, you know, group portraits usually aren't have exactly the same size. So there are different sizes or masses of objects. Another example would be a landscape. Almost always the objects closest to a viewer in a landscape are the largest mass as we see them as they appear on that painting in the surface That's, painting. Yes, okay. please. What about the, I'm sorry, go back to the to the same painting, the last supper by Leonardo da Vinci. Sure. It could please. be the table. Yes, that would be the largest mass, I think, but it might be the wall of the room they're in. I haven't been looking at that painting for like eight months or so now since I two semesters ago, last time I taught Renaissance art, but I know it. Uh, yeah, I, th I think the largest mass in that painting, but you, you can tell by looking, is the, 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 the main, you know, either the ceiling or the side, two walls on either side. I think they're larger than the table, which would make the table the second largest mass. Okay. And then you decide, see, I give you total flexibility on these things when it's not 100% clear cut. Mm -hmm. For example, if you think, let's take the, that's always a good example of famous painting like that, The Last Supper, where there's 13 human bodies across, the, you know, the, the top of the table. Is that a single mass because it's all a group of people and they're overlapping each other in the painting because they're close, so close together? Mm -hmm. Not social distancing, not in that painting. Uh, so yes, you could say that's a single mass of human bodies. Then you wow. might call that the third largest mass. But if you broke it down into individual, you'd have to say, okay, what is the largest human figure that I can see the upper part of their body, in my opinion. And I'm not gonna take points off if you see something differently than I do, as long as you explain where you see those elements and why. That's why you need to give examples. 
So okay. yeah, the table would be one of the two largest masses in, in the painting of the Last Supper, absolutely. I think it's the second largest because my memory of it is the room around them is slightly larger. Mm. Yeah, you, you just use your judgment on these things and there will be, like I said, almost no case where, I, I mean, there's some things aren't cut and dry, absolute either or, and that's part of art, isn't it? Or part of human yeah. creativity. So you shouldn't get too worried or stressed that I'm, you know, well, what if he doesn't agree and he thinks this is the largest mass? Mm. I'm not going to take points off if you explain yourself. And it, it, unless it's just really obviously wrong, like way off. For instance, if somebody said a piece of bread in front of Jesus's hands, because there is one in that painting, he's kind of looks like he's reaching for it, right? As he tells them the bad news about him being betrayed is the largest mass. Well, that would be wrong, clearly, because the table is bigger and the room's bigger. Okay, other than an extreme obvious example, you have flexibility in, in my classes, at least, to decide for yourself where you see the rhythm or if you think a painting is more dynamic than stable uh or, or what's the largest two or three masses okay that was a, it's a good thing to ask those examples uh to bring them up any other questions on number five because that this one i'll tell you now this is the one more people forget to analyze than any of the other nine elements or other eight <laughs> uh if they forget any it somehow gets overlooked more often than i don't know why it's so easy relatively easy for you to write about comparatively Okay, we're halfway through roughly. Any other questions at this point on number five? Okay, textures. Now this is an interesting, I think, um, uh, technique. Textures are what an artist uses if they're simulated as in a painting or a drawing, right? Um, then that's when an artist uses lines, color, and shading to create the illusion of real textures. So in a painting, Let's take a portrait. I think some of you have seen the famous portrait of Henry VIII. You know, uh, he has this horrible, I mean, you almost can see what kind of a nasty person he was just by the expression on his face. There's so many portraits of him, you probably, if you've seen any, it doesn't matter which one, they all have a similar quality to them. They're detailed, realistic portraits, because that's what people did in the Renaissance. That's all they did when it came to portraits. They didn't do abstract, stylized, expressionist work of the last 150 years. That's a much more recent thing. So in a realistic painting, whether it's from Renaissance or later, you're going to see simulated textures, meaning the artist is going to try and simulate, right? Imitate is the other way to say it, but the right word is sim with an S right there. Simulate the textures of hair. Well, he wore fur. Nobody worried about fur back then, right? Uh, uh, collar, right? Uh, and um, embroidered uh, robe, right? Or, or, or jacket that he was wearing. Silk probably embroidered. Uh, and then his skin right? Uh, and so those are all simulated textures. And you would say, are they sharp? Meaning if it's a realistic painting, well, all the Renaissance paintings are by definition. They didn't use any other techniques, but sharp, or you could say realistic if you want to, or strong. I would accept any of those words, but the easiest one to remember is sharp. Simulated textures are visible on this portrait of King Henry VIII, uh, for instance, on his hair, uh, his beard, um, his skin and uh, you know, the, the jacket he's wearing or the collar of the jacket. It's usually that's where you see the Renaissance kings almost always had uh, fancy uh, fur for the collars of their coats. Okay, what about if it's an Impressionist painting or later? Roughly 150 years ago, the history of painting changed. And if you take my art 2.1.2 uh, or 2.2 or 2.3, I think I'll be teaching at least one of those next semester. So maybe I'll see a few of you then <laughs> on the small screen, probably still by distance learning. Uh, then we'll talk about Impressionism, but you can write about it for this class if you want to pick an Impressionist painting. Those textures are not sharp and realistic. They're just hinted at because they're not trying to be super sharp. That's the whole idea of Impressionism, as many of you know, is to break away from all those rules of Renaissance realism. I like to say it that way. So what are those kinds of textures if they're soft? You can say soft, but a better word is diffused with an I. There it is. So softer diffused textures are common in Impressionist and some what's called post-Impressionist paintings, like we discussed last week with the Van Gogh painting on the silver. Oh. So if you weren't here, you can catch that lecture. Remember, it's already on YouTube. Okay, what about sculpture and uh, architecture? Most of the textures there, let's take, the, again, Michelangelo's David. They're either real, right, textures, 
because it's smooth marble. So obviously you can tell that by looking almost. And if you can't tell for sure, you can look it up uh, about whatever. If you're writing about a work of sculpture, you do need to describe the fact if it is a realistic portrait of a person or an animal or you know a living thing, it's going to have both the real texture of the stone. And then some stones rough, of course, you know, volcanic stone, right? Various kinds of stone can be rough. Granite is rough, uh, like what's used on the Great Pyramids uh, and some uh, Egyptian sculpture. But it might be marble or some other smooth stone. That's what you need to say. It's is a real smooth texture of marble and simulated texture for the carved lines on the face, the hair, the muscles, like in the David. Because of course that's simulating the textures of skin and muscles and fingernails and so forth. So most sculpture has both. The material itself, which whatever that is smoother or, or rough is real. And then the carved lines create simulated texture. Buildings usually the textures are real and only real. You don't see too many buildings. Occasionally, if you ever lived in a Victorian house, maybe a few of you have, I did once. Well, I had an aunt that owned one in Indianapolis. And all of the fireplaces were wood, but they were painted to look like marble. Well, that's a, a rare exception where, okay, that's a simulated texture. Inside Victorian houses, sometimes you'd see that, but that's, that's not likely to be something you'll write about. So just in general, and then all the slides in this class of architecture, the textures are real. And then you need to describe, remember we did this last week with the Frank Lloyd Wright Museum in New York, what the materials are, at least two or three most prominent ones, like concrete, glass, metal, and those are usually smooth textures. And then sometimes you have an older building made out of stone, and those might be rough real stone textures. So textures in a building are almost always real, not simulated. Okay, I'm going to catch my breath, take a, a drink of water, and see if you have any questions about uh, number six. No, no. Okay, we're doing really well on the time. Modeling. Now this I'm going to do a little bit more filling in. Modeling, that is the technique, not the career. Modeling is when an artist uses contrasting, it's all, these definitions are all in your handouts. Um, when an artist uses contrasting areas of light and dark or light and shadow, to create the illusions, uh, the illusion, I'm sorry, of three dimensions or three-dimensional object is a better way to say it. So I'm taking this giant stone ball that was found in Renaissance gardens, believe it or not, that was a popular free. And after the, you know, okay, we could just say the misguided voyage of Columbus, whatever else we can all say about him, no question that changed the world, <laughs> no question. Because nobody before him, except a few very well-educated people who didn't talk about it, thought the world was round, right? I think you know that yeah. from history. Mm -hmm. So once that happened in Europe, they got into a craze of making giant round stone balls for their garden ornaments <laughs> and on the tops of staircases and at the entrances of public buildings, they were just called globes because they knew finally that the world was round. Finally learned that. Uh, by the way, the ancient Polynesians knew that. Anybody from Hawaii or have friends from Hawaii? One of my readers is native Hawaiian. And she rightfully points out, well, we made it across the, uh, the entire Pacific Ocean, the largest body of water on Earth, and knew that my ancestors knew that the Earth wasn't flat 3,000 or was it 2,000 2, years ago. But in any case, for Europeans, it was a new deal back after about the beginning of the 1500s. So if you, you saw a Renaissance era garden, you, you could see this exactly, this kind of a giant round ball, you know, usually carved out of smooth, could be granite and rough, but usually smooth. But we're not talking about texture now, we're talking about how if you were to see a painting or a drawing of such an object, how would the artist use modeling to make it look round, three-dimensional? They would shade the area where the light is not hitting, right? That's in shadow. And that's why I do the arrow. The arrow is implying the light's coming from the lower uh, right side in this. And so I drew that uh, shading there. Let me go ahead and try and maybe fill it out a little bit. So I'll step in front of the camera just for a second. Can we point, for example, the, the painting that we saw the other time, Vincent by, uh, by Van Gogh, the yes. wheat film? Yes, that, what, what's your question about the Van Gogh painting? It, it could be, um, for I, example, modeling. 
Yes, there was modeling in that there. That's a little better, actually. Just a little more realistic. Yeah, modeling was used in Va in Van Gogh's paintings, but he made he made the modeling kind of soft, not strong. Mm -hmm. Diffused again, you could use that word. So artists can use modeling, you know, and not make it super sharp. So if you're right, it's a good point you brought up because I almost forgot to say this. In a painting, a modeling or, or a drawing, like an engraving, and even some photos, if the camera is slightly less than sharp focus, that the artist, the photographer chose not to focus super sharp on that photo, like some famous photographers did that all the way back to the 1800s. So mostly though in paintings, you're going to see sometimes with like Van Gogh, he's post-impressionist and earlier before, 30 years earlier, the post, the early impressionist. They, they would use modeling, but they wouldn't make it strong or sharp they would make it more soft or diffuse, but there still is a contrast of areas of shadow and light in almost every, in fact, every uh, impressionist painting I've ever seen and most of the next generation called post-impressionists like Van Gogh used modeling. Yes, they did, uh, but they didn't always make it super sharp. So your, your job when you write about modeling is to see, is it sharp? See, that's why I wrote sharp or soft. I actually didn't quite okay. get this right, I'm gonna try. Because it's usually one or the other. You rarely see both diffused and sharp simulated textures in the same. There we go. That's good. Um, so yeah, just like with with um, you know with the modeling and the simulated textures, they can be in you know, an impressive painting. Almost always going to be soft or diffused textures or simulated textures, and also soft or diffused modeling. But in a realistic painting, Renaissance era painting, or anything done in a sharp, realistic style, the uh, modeling is going to be sharp. Or you could say strong or realistic, if you prefer those words. OK, any questions on, on modeling? Because it's something you can tell when you see it, pretty much. But you do have to describe, like I said, you know, two sentences would be plenty, What, where you see any modeling. Just give me two examples. You know, usually, there's plenty of examples of modeling in a, a, a painting, like a landscape, or a group portrait, or even or even a still life. Uh, and, and then say if those, uh, the use of modeling in those parts of the painting you're writing about is sharp, you could say, or strong, or is it soft and diffused? Now I'm gonna go get a uh, print. I'll be right, I'm not leaving. <laughs> I forgot to bring it off the wall. To show you about color. It's important to get this what we thought. Okay, there we go, coming right back. Okay, color is a little more complex. Some of you will have questions, and that's what we're here for. So don't hesitate. All the lean again, please. Pardon? Can you please um, repeat the definition? Yeah, well, I'm just saying when it comes to color, there are three types of colors that you're going to write about or see in the works of art you choose for your papers and also on uh, at least many of the slides in this class. Colors. They're mostly now here. I didn't have room to write the definitions that those are all on your handouts, though. So you shouldn't have a problem with following me along. You don't have to write this. It should be right in front of you in the printout of the nine elements. There's three categories of colors you should be aware of in this course that you would be writing about. Uh, unless it's a black and white work of art. But even then, it's one of the three that makes the work of art neutral, such as my drawing of this globe with the light hitting it from below. That is not a warm or cool color. It's black and white. Mm -hmm. So any work of art that is all black and white or shades of gray with black and white, and that's it, no other kinds of colors. That's not considered warm or cool. Those are neutral colors. So I'll start with that. Neutral colors mean a work of art where the artists only use black and white or shades of, you know, gray, of course, which is part of black and white, uh, the spectrum of black and white. And there, that would be just called neutral colors. Uh, doesn't, doesn't have any effect on our eyesight other than just, okay, that's just, you know, black and white and shades of black and white. Th then that work of art, you just, it has a simple job. If you're writing about a black and white painting or print or engraving, you don't have to describe where are warm and cool colors. There aren't any. If it's all black and white, and shades of black and white, it's just neutral. So now let's get to the warm colors. What are those? This is again, all written out on your handouts. 
Warm colors are earth tones. In other words, I didn't write this, but that, what does that mean? That, uh, they're uh, colors that come from the earth, from nature. Um, and those are listed. And I'm pretty sure I can remember every one of them. <laughs> uh, the mo like 90% of all warm colors are one of the following. Red, yellow, orange, brown, pink, and gold. That comprises almost all the types of warm colors. W who cares? So what? Why do we divide colors into warm and cool, the main categories? Be very important reason. And if you were here last week, you remember we covered this with the portrait uh, of the uh, Libyan Sybil by Michelangelo. Because why do artists use warm, use warm colors in a, in a painting, a, a color work of art, or, or it could be a drawing? Because warm colors appear to advance toward the viewer. In our eyesight, it's an automatic reaction if you have typical uh, full, you know, color vision. I know that not everybody does. I have an uncle that didn't, you know, but if you do, your eyesight, it's subconscious. You'll pick up in your eyesight. Your brain will uh, register first without you even having to think about it. The warm colors, you'll notice them before you notice anything else in that painting. So what are the uh, opposing colors that aren't warm? They're called cool. Cool colors are very specific. There are four categories. And they are blue, green, gray, and white. Now, that's why I said this is more complex. If you've been really focusing on this last thing on color, you probably stopped and said, wait a minute, didn't Mr. Wilson just say that black and white are neutral? Yes, when they're only by themselves with no warm colors around them. But if you have a painting with an area of gray or white objects next to something red, say, or orange, and I'll prove it to you in just a second, you're going to notice the warm colors first. So by contrast, the cool colors, why do artists use them? Because they appear to recede in the eye of the viewer when they are next to warm colors. Let's take an example. Here's a cover of a, uh, now I'm going to have to hold this where you can, yeah, I think you can all see it there. Yeah, there we go. Oops, the reflection there, that's a bit of a problem. There, that's a little better. Trying to get it lined up. You know what? Mm, that's reflecting off of it. So <laughs> there, that's better because what I want you to see is the house. Okay, what do you notice about the house? Well, it's got a red roof and yellow walls. If you're looking, you know, hopefully you can see that. And those are the two colors. They're warm, obviously, they're earth tones. They're, they're, some people call them bright, but that's not quite correct. That's a little too simplistic. So don't use that phrase. They're warm colors or earth tones. The red door, for instance, you notice that? If I raise it there, now you see a little better. The path has a kind of a brownish dirt color. Those are the colors that you notice first. Your eyesight will, subco eyesight will subconsciously pick up on those colors first. And so those warm colors were used by this artist because they wanted you to pay attention. By the way, if anybody knows your, probably most of you don't, the term storybook style, that house is, would have been a brand new style in 1919. Guess what was happening in the world in 1919? If you know your history, we've been through it. 100 years ago, the last worldwide pandemic was happening and it was affecting my great grandparents, not anybody alive now. Well, yeah, actually a few people are still alive in that. Anyway, then what do you see around it? You see, let me hold it steady, sorry. You see the blue sky, but that's after your eyes have picked up on the house and the colors of yellow and red and a little bit of brown in the path in front of it. Then next you might notice the green of the, of the um, grass. And then finally, perhaps the trees and then the sky, because those are cool colors. I mean, one tree there off to the far left, at least on my left, uh, it might be kind of the tallest one might be kind of neutral black, but the other two trees on either side of the roof, those are green. So those are cool colors and you don't notice them as soon or as quickly as you would at least subconsciously notice the red and the yellow and the brown. Um, that's just, it's a universal human reaction for uh, typically uh, color, full color sighting. Uh, when you look at a picture like this. Okay, that's pretty straightforward, except for one other thing. And this, I think I wrote this on, I can't remember, I've tried to modify the list of nine elements, the definitions. If I didn't, you should write this, because uh, we're almost done, we're down to the last, but it's more complex, the different 
techniques for space. But to wrap up on color, what about human skin tones? Well, okay, there's this, this is a simple, straightforward, no exceptions rule of thumb about color. All human skin tones are considered to be warm, even though some look less warm than others, depending on your perspective, your, you know, whatever way of seeing or the color of the painting of the person, whatever their background is, doesn't matter. I'll say it again. All human skin tones are considered to be warm co colors. Because they have various mixtures of the colors I just mentioned to you, right? Brown, uh, yellow, orange, gold, pink, red, and, and, and various mixtures of those. Of course, I mean, that's just common knowledge, but most people wouldn't think of it that way. So that is something to be aware of. When you're writing about a portrait of a person or a group portrait, uh, you, you would then notice the, um, or you should no, notice that all the human figures uh, where their skin is shown are warm colors. Okay, I just did myself a little damage here, but I can fix it. So let's move on to space, the final technique. Uh, yeah, uh, yes, I can remember the original Star Trek series on TV when William Shatner was still thin <laughs> and kind of like, you know, a, 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 what was his favorite line, right? I can't remember what he said in that show. Anyway, it's the original 1960s TV show. Yes, okay, space, the final frontier. Now we're talking about space, the final technique. There are six techniques for depicting space that you need to be aware of in this class and that you need to write about there. That's good enough. Okay, six. So let's start with the simplest one, overlapping. I actually put them side by side, but you see I put a semicolon, so don't confuse. They're not the same thing. Overlapping, well, start with the simplest. Everyone knows it when you see it. I mean, it, the, the word is self-descriptive. When you have two or more objects in a work of art, uh, you know, whether it's a painting or even a group sculpture or something, right? A group of figures in one sculpture or drawing or photo. Um, that object which overlaps everything behind it is meant to look closer to us, the viewer, and those objects that are being overlapped are meant to appear further away. And you don't have to write that. I don't think so, right? Everybody knows that when you see it. Overlapping is the oldest technique known in human history. Very first slide we're going to see right after the break. It's a cave painting. There's a lot of interesting facts about it. But when it comes to the techniques, the only technique artists in the prehistoric paintings could, could use, knew how to use, was overlapping. It's the oldest, most simple technique ever devised by human beings to depict depth or space, you know, in an object, uh, I mean, in a, in a painting. When objects overlap, obviously the one doing the overlapping is closest to us. That, that I don't think needs any further explanation. Now, register line is less common to most people because only ancient cultures like the Egyptians used it a lot. We'll see a couple examples in this class of that about two weeks from tonight when we get to Egyptian art. Register line's two words, and don't put an ED on it. It's not registered line. It's not trying to, you know, get a ballot to vote <clears throat> in uh, the fall election uh, or become, you know, uh, applicant for a job. It's not registered with an ED. It's register with an R, two words, line. What is that? That's when uh, a um, horizontal line, two or more, sorry, two or more horizontal lines are drawn onto the composition and those objects on the lower lines are meant to look closer to the viewer and those objects on the upper line, sorry, are meant to look further away. The Egyptians used that technique combined with overlapping and in most ancient art, those are the only two techniques the artists knew how to use. We're talking about thousands of years ago, right? Uh, it got a little more sophisticated as time moves on. You'll see that with the slides in this class. Okay, what about diminishing size? Again, these first three, three techniques are pretty self-explanatory, but I will give you the definitions. Think all but the last two are actually written out on your handouts, but if not, you should write in any that aren't. Okay, that's when you have multiple objects shown, you know, in a two-dimensional work of art. I don't have to keep saying that. It's obviously this applies to two-dimensional works of art, like a painting or uh, a, a painting or drawing. Uh, so when uh, multiple objects are shown in a work of art, those objects that are depicted larger are meant to be closer to us or the viewer, and those objects shown smaller are meant to be further away 
again, that's how we see space in the real, if we have, you know, uh, typical or, uh, you know, complete vision. I have minor problem with depth perception. I was born that way. So was my daughter, even though she's from Russia, I was born halfway around the world uh, and 50 years later. Uh, you can have it. It's, I hate this phrase. Some people may know what I'm talking about. Lazy eye. I mean, that is the most disgustingly insulting phrase. It's actually strabismus, where one eye doesn't focus as well, so you don't have full depth perception. And uh, so I can tell that this board is about a foot away, but it actually is probably, you know, an inch more or less than I, my eyesight tells me. But even with limited depth perception, if you have at least pretty much full vision, you know, your vision of both eyes, you're going to, to notice that we see the, the reality this way. You see objects in the real space this way. When they're further away, they look smaller. It's just how human brains perceive distance. So all this technique is doing is, is mimicking the way the real world looks to human beings when we look at it. So again, it's a technique with you know multiple objects in which the largest ones are meant to be closer and the smallest ones are meant to be further away. Okay, moving over here for shortening. This is a little more complex, but not too complex. And this also, I'm, I'm sure I wrote the definition of this. Uh, for shortening is when an artist depicts an object uh, in a two-dimensional work of art. You don't have to always keep writing that, of course. Um, it depicts an object in which that part of the object closest to the viewer appears wider, and that part of the object furthest away from the viewer appears narrower. And a good example would be the stones. We're gonna see them, actual stones in my photos of Stonehenge from when I was there the most recently. I took a whole roll of film and I'll just show you a few of the best shots. When the stones at Stonehenge fell down, that's what happened to them. They look like this. And then when you walk up to them, you can't you know, always immediately tell how big they are. Some of them are 18 feet. In fact, a couple are 22 feet long. The ones that fell over and a few that are still standing, of course, are that high. So if you looked at a painting or a drawing or photo, of uh, Stonehenge, you're going to see foreshortening, no question, because dozens of those stones, or something like two dozen, the majority have fallen over in thousands of years since it was abandoned by the ancient tribe that built it. So those images are going to look like this, and it's going to be foreshortening. That's just the way that we see objects receding, especially if they're long objects into the distance. So again, it's when an artist shows an object in which the part closest to the viewer is meant to be, it is shown, I'm sorry, as wider and the part farthest away is shown as narrower. So far, so good. Now we get to the two most complex techniques ever invented. Atmospheric perspective. Could not illustrate that even if I was a um, really great artist with a black and white pen on a whiteboard. Why? This is a technique that's only uh, used for color works of art. And I'll say the definition. I don't think I, I might have written this out. I can't remember. But if not, you do want to write this. Atmospheric perspective is a technique for depicting space or depth in a work of art, comma, in which those objects farthest away from the viewer appear bluer and hazier than those objects closest to the viewer. If you don't know that already, next time you drive across Katati grade, check it out. You'll see what I mean, and you can test yourself. Be careful. Don't go off the freeway, right, or into the lane of the car next to you if you're looking. But when it's safe, right, look towards the west, especially noticeable in the late afternoon or early morning when the light isn't as sh harsh as it is at noon. But even at high noon, when the sun's directly overhead, the effect is there. The farther away the mountains are, the bluer and hazier they look. It's just the effect the atmosphere has. Now, of course, with the smoke, it might be harder to see the blue part of the, the, uh, the hazy part it would be easy. But you see what I mean? And when it's a normal clear day, it's very obvious. And that's just the effect of the atmosphere on our eyesight. That's pretty self-explanatory. Okay, the last technique is the most complex one, and it's one that many of you already know because I can tell many of you say you were already uh, accomplished artists, and you put, many of you would have studied this, and even perhaps some of you are now in a studio art class. Scientific perspective, and this is the last definition for now, and we'll take our break in a few minutes, um, is a technique for depicting space 
invented during the Italian Renaissance. That's not a minor detail. That's part of the, the meaning of it. it. Didn't exist before the Italian Renaissance artists invented it. So it's a technique for depicting space in a two-dimensional work of art. You always get to add that. Invented during the Italian Renaissance, comma, in which the artist draws a series of diagonal lines. You see them there with the arrow onto the surface, which all meet at a common vanishing point on the horizon. So as poorly done as that is, I think you get the idea from having, even though those lines are not totally straight, one of them is a little wobbly, but I redo this three times, and that's as good as it's going to get. But you get the idea that in a realistic looking Renaissance painting, especially a landscape or, or a cityscape or townscape, you're going to have a horizon visible. Well, guess what the artist did before he started painting in all the details of the buildings and the landscape and the people? Uh, he actually, or she, artist, there were some women artists we're going to talk about, not very many in this class because they weren't given the credit they deserved in the ancient world. But there were some, and we will actually talk about that. Uh, but when you get to the Renaissance, you start seeing women beginning to break through very slowly the uh, prejudice of that era against women uh, professionals of any kind, of course. Very slowly but steadily, they, they began to break the uh, barriers down. Uh, by the end of the Renaissance, there were several dozen successful women painters in Europe. But anyway, we'll say that he or she would do. What would they do, if the artist, to create this technique? Before they started the painting, they would draw right onto the surface of whatever it is they're, you know, if the canvas or whatever material they're painting on. Actual diagonal lines, they're called the orthogonals, but I'm trying to keep things simple, so I didn't write that here. They're just diagonal lines, that's all you need to remember. And they would all meet at a common vanishing point, and this one doesn't really quite, there we go, this one is more well-rounded. And that would be on the horizon line. And that would give the illusion of how objects really recede in size. So it's like a combination of two techniques, diminishing size, because the objects arranged, whether they are people walking on a road or boulders along you know, a stream or, or houses in a town on a street or whatever, uh, they're going to fade, you know, trees, what have you, uh, in size consistently the way we actually see them with our human eyesight. Uh, into the distance and then eventually, right, uh, they, they all reach a common vanishing point. And so then they paint over the lines, obviously. Very rarely do you see the lines in a Renaissance or any realistic painting where the artist uses this technique. It's usually just the underlay of the uh, work before they begin the actual details. Okay, last thing. I didn't draw this because it's just a statement, but you definitely want to write this. In a building, space is not a technique, it is real space. And if you were here last week, you remember we covered it when we talked about the Frank Lloyd Wright Museum, right, the Guggenheim in New York, how you would need to describe just the two or three largest spaces inside a building. That's all you have to do. When you write about space for a piece of art, <coughs> an architectural site, uh, even if it's a house, especially a large public building. You don't have to describe multiple different rooms and things or the exact height and width. If you know it, you should, but you could just describe the relative size of the different larger, like three largest spaces would be fine. Uh, what are the three largest rooms in this building, this hotel, this skyscraper, this uh, museum? Uh, you know, um, and you know, are they two or three stories like the ceiling in some lobbies of hotels is multiple? stories, right, where they go all the way up to like a balcony. Uh, you've all seen buildings like that. So all you have to do is use, you know, common language in describing the relative size of the largest space inside or spaces, two or three largest uh, rooms or spaces inside a building. And that's how you write about space in architecture. So I've had students miss an A on a paper because they didn't think that carefully through that and then they just said uh, this is uh, this building has no techniques for space of course not architecture isn't about pretending to imitate space with these other techniques it, it's real space buildings are enclosed space that's the actual definition of architecture i think we've covered everything but i don't hear any other questions anybody have any now
because uh, that's a lot. I do want to say this. Don't get too worried. I hope you won't. Certainly don't get discouraged. If it isn't all clear to you right now, this early on, and we're still early days here, and there'll be plenty of time to, you can show me samples of your paper, by the way. Well, you have to email them to me as a PDF, and I can give you feedback if you're on the right track, missing anything or need to add anything before the deadline. The first paper's not due till the seventh week, so that's five weeks from now. So you have plenty of time and we'll talk about writing the papers and how they should look next week. But hopefully this helps. You don't need to take a screenshot, I don't think. Well, maybe you want, <laughs> but I had well, students. I did there. already. <laughs> Pardon? I, I took a screenshot. Of oh, well, that's good. Yeah, I'm just saying. <laughs> yeah, well, you could use your, your people in my classroom, of course, at Annaly Hall would come up at the break and take out their cell phones and shove each other to get in front of it. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Mm -hmm. Anyway, so they can all get their own image and take it home. But this is a, is the simplest way to describe these elements as a starting point. And then the more detailed way to understand them is read each chapter of Gill, The Critic Sees, because she goes into more detail and gives more examples than I have time for. But I think we're about due for a break. Uh, yeah, we are. It's very close to, to halfway. We won't go till, uh, I don't think we'll go to 9.45 tonight, but we have four slides. Like I said, we start slow. And yes, any one of them could be on the exam. In fact, I'm going to go ahead and tell you for sure, at least one slide we'll see after our break will be on the midterm. So you want to uh, take notes. And, and I think you'll find them interesting. The cave paintings and then um, a fertility object. I'll explain what that means. <laughs> Uh, and the controversy around those. And then last, we'll end with Stonehenge uh, and, and the myths about Stonehenge that some people may have heard. Okay, so I'm gonna stop the recording and you guys can take 20 minutes, okay? I'll see you all in about 20 minutes from now. Okay, hopefully most of you are back or will be in the next few minutes. So what I'm going to do now is the screen share where we go to the slide view. You don't have to see my craggy face the rest of this evening until the end of the evening. Well, we just have four slides to cover. There we go. Now I'm going to get it larger. So there. Now everyone can see this is the first must know slide. And of course, you need to take notes. I always say if there must know, that means in case you weren't here last week, that this could be on the exam. We will cut the list down by a good 40, maybe 50% before the two tests. However, when you first see a must know slide, and I tell you that it is, you should assume it, it could be on the test and take, you know, thorough notes. I covered this last week. If there's, I think there are though, right? Two or three new people here tonight. Uh, uh, very briefly, how to take notes in a nutshell is to use two subheadings for each slide. I will tell you the title and I'll do that in just a minute for this slide and each one that comes up that is on the syllabus, I will say it's a must know. So this is one of those. After giving you the title, I will only spell the words once though because we, we don't want to get bogged down and they're on your syllabus. So if, if you write them for tonight, um, you know, then you'll see them on the syllabus when you print it out, if you ask me to forward one to you by attachment uh, tomorrow, if you don't have it, already have it. Okay, so the first category of the two categories to take, all your notes under the two main subheadings are, is meaning. So let's talk about this slide, uh, this first one for tonight, Hall of Bulls, plural. Just three words, pretty straightforward, and I think everyone can spell those words. Hall, of course, with two L's in bulls, plural. Hall of Bulls is the title. Now, we don't know the artist. In most ancient works, we only know a few of them. And as you get toward Greek and Roman art, we start to know the names of the artists, but not this far back. So we give you the location. And what I have on the syllabus, if you're looking at it, is the town and country. Sometimes I just give the country, but there are a lot of prehistoric cave paintings in southern France, so you have to say which which one this is. So here we go. The location is two words. Lascaux, France. That's first word is the is the town. L-A-S-C-A-U-X. Lascaux, France. 
and the date is 15,000 BC. I explained this last week. Most of the world still, if you travel as much as I have, you'll see this, still uses BC and AD. It's just a convenient way of demarking uh, the, the period in you know, human history that the uh, time frame is that you're talking about. But if you prefer BCE and CE, that's fine. You can use that on your papers or your tests. Okay, so 15,000 uh, BC or BCE. Well, let's start with the first fact about the meaning is that this is a prehistoric cave painting. Okay, so everyone should have your other handout I sent now, I think to everybody, unless you just joined the last 24 hours. List of terms to know. We went over this last week. Um, this week, there are going to be three. And the first one is the third one down on this list on the first page. Just like it sounds, one word, prehistoric. That is a short, easy definition. Here it is. <clears throat> Prehistoric is that period in any culture's history before written records were kept. It's pretty simple and clear cut. There isn't much ambiguity about this definition. Again, prehistoric is that period in any culture's history before written records were kept. So I will ask, and if anybody still has energy to respond, I'd be happy to hear. And if not, I'll give you examples. Can anybody think of any examples of prehistoric cultures in the world today? You know, it's not, it's not a value judgment. It's just a, a way of recording things. So anybody can think of a, 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 any cultures in the modern world that don't record their events in a written format? Isn't there um, a tribe in Africa that still do, um, That's true. doesn't have any writing? That's true. Right, in the Inuit people. Uh, I have friends who live in uh, that part of Canada that's you know, right on the edge of the Inuit territory. And I have a number of friends from Australia over the years, uh, an Aboriginal culture, which is one of the oldest in the world, by the way, continuously uh, kept their traditions. Their oral traditions is how they pass on information. So absolutely, yes, there are prehistoric cultures in the world today. Every society has had a period of prehistoric art or prehistoric uh, events, whether or not they still are or not is nothing to do with, you know, the different um, aspects of a culture. It's just a statement of descriptive value in nature, I should say, descriptive uh, phrase, that's all. So yeah, this was a European prehistoric culture that painted this particular cave painting. So here are the facts besides that, the fact it is the first thing you should write in your, under meaning. It's a prehistoric cave painting, okay. The, uh, the context is that it's one of a series of dozens of such cave paintings on the walls of a complex, it's not just one cave, it's, they're, they're linked. It, this is from the uh, walls of a complex of caves in southern France, period. That's when Lascaux is a town in southern France. So th this is over one, sorry, one scene in over 230 feet long, a series. You could say series or complex of caves. So you could spend days walking through here and not see them all. It's, it's one of my students wrote that it's like the Louvre of prehistoric art. Well, actually, in a way it is. <laughs> I'd never thought of that. And it is in France where the Louvre itself is, of course. Okay, but you could write that if you want, but that's not really what most historians would say about it. What, what do we think the meaning is about this scene that it's depicting? Well, it's obviously several different types of animals, and my cursor here will point out an albino. Now, that's rare. They do exist in nature. I've actually seen one or two in my life uh, in uh, parts of the world. Uh, so, an albino, actually, bull is wrong. That's, you know, how things get mis- construed in some historic text. <laughs> Big surprise, right? Uh, so really, it's not a bull at all, but we've taken to calling this the Hall of Bulls is a short way of describing this work of art, this scene. Okay, so the right word is a bison. It's an albino bison, right? Uh, and then the other animals are pretty obvious. There are two other kinds. Horses, right? One large brown horse and four, uh, is it three? Yes, yeah, three. Sometimes I think it's four, three smaller black horses. And then a black and a brown reindeer, of course. All of these animals uh, still exist at that time. 
they were roaming free. And of course, what's the purpose or the underlying uh, message that this painting is trying to convey? The artist or artist, it could have been a group of artists. It could have been one person. So the theory is that this is a hunting, the leading, sorry, let me say it again. The leading theory about the meaning of this prehistoric cave painting is that it's a hunting ritual painting. Just that, three, three words describing it is that it's, most historians believe it's a hunting ritual painting. Well, what does that mean? Well, I think most of you already know without having to connect the dots uh, from any history, world history, or just common you know, knowledge of things. This period in history, there was no farming. <laughs> Uh, these were prehistoric uh, nomadic tribes. They sometimes stayed in one place for a while, but when the hunting, that's how they survived. They had no other choice. They definitely needed to hunt these animals to survive. There, there's no debating that. The evidence is obvious, but also just the history of the, the, the uh, development of early human societies. We know they hadn't developed uh, farming yet. And yes, you could be gather berries, but that isn't going to feed a tribe of hundreds of people, especially not in the winter. So they would hunt these animals for survival. For f what purposes? Well, of course, you already know first and foremost for food, but also for other necessities, as you can probably, again, already guess, uh, for uh, clothing, you know, from the skin, uh, and for weapons and tools from the bones. So that's what a multi purpose. <laughs> Uh, reason to to hunt these animals out of necessity for survival. There, there wasn't really much um, alternative choice. Okay, now what any if any other theory is there about this? That if it's not a hunting ritual painting, what else could be the purpose for why it was painted? Well, here's another word you don't have to remember for the exam, but for this slide it has relevance. A holy person, usually this far back, they were men, and we know in this culture they were good men. But there were some women holy figures too. But the word shaman is S-H-A-M-A-N. You don't have to know that word for the exam. But for the notes on this slide, you might want to write it. A holy person, or in parentheses, shaman, would either paint it himself or have a group of people painting it under his direction. And so why? Why would they do that? We already said the leading theory is to guarantee a successful hunt of these animals. I didn't really say it in those words, so you should write that. That's what they thought this painting could help. They believed in magic, okay? Pretty much that's a given with almost all prehistoric cultures. And not just prehistoric cultures, obviously, <laughs> uh, but certainly in prehistoric times, it was, it was one of the ways they, they interpreted what was happening in the universe around them. So they believed in magic powers that they could have over these animals and guarantee they would have a successful hunt. Because every time their, their uh, hunters went out, they had to bring back, right? They to, they, I started to say, bring back the bacon. That's a silly phrase that doesn't fit here. But obviously we're talking about bring back the, the goods that, that, that they needed, the meat, the, the bodies, the carcasses, if you want to call it that, uh, of the bodies of these animals so that they could survive with the food, the clothing, the tools, and weapons that they needed to take from these animals. But there's another theory. It is that Yes, we know they had to do that. Some historians just say a second theory, less commonly accepted theory, is that, well, this was depicting animals that they did hunt, but the purpose might not have been to guarantee a successful hunt, that they would be able to kill these animals upon you know, finding them in, in their hunting forays. Uh, so what other purpose could it be? To show that this tribe had... Um, respect and admiration for the strength, speed, and beauty of these animals. Well, that's a nice theory, and it's possible that it's part of the reason, and most historians would, would put it this way, that this was painted, because no question they had to have some respect for the, these animals were, you know, magnificent in the wild, of course, and often escaped their, their hunters. But I doubt they spent a lot of time when they were barely surviving <laughs> They had to constantly be hunting to survive, just trying to show their respect for the animals. It, it, it just begs the question, but it, it's a possibility. Anybody ever see Sister Wendy, the uh, PBS nun? About 10 years ago, she had her own TV show. Maybe it was a little more now. Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah. actually, it's pretty good. Yeah, been... that, that was my favorite show. I <laughs> loved it. Yeah, I, I recorded them back on VHS. I <laughs> can't use that now. Anyway, the point is that she really knew her stuff. She had a PhD from, I don't know, Oxford or somewhere. Uh, she thinks she was British. Pretty sure she was. Yeah. Anyway, the point is she knew her history. And she felt the second theory was more likely, but most historians figure it's the other way around. Yeah, that could have been another reason, an additional reason in addition to trying to guarantee a successful, successful hunt. But well, you know what? We don't know. The whole point is this is a prehistoric. There's no written records. We have to use the uh, context of the art that is what's found nearby. We found the bones and things. So we know they hunted the animals for survival. There's no debate of that. But whether the painting was strictly a hunting ritual painting or maybe both that and a, a tip of their, well, they didn't wear hats. So <laughs> a sign of respect, I should say, on the part of this prehistoric culture uh, is, is, is to these animals for their strength and beauty is is open to debate, let's put it that way, but it's possible. Okay, switching to the formal analysis, the second subcategory for all your notes. We can start with the fact that the only technique for space here is overlapping. You might think this is diminishing size. If you think it is, I wouldn't take points off if you were to write about that and say that on the midterm, or if you wrote a paper about this or any other prehistoric cave painting. It could be that deer is meant to be farther away but there's no consistency here to, uh, for instance, this deer would have to be one gigantic deer if it's in the same plane as these horses. Even if these are smaller horses, uh, it, it's unlikely. It's probably not meant to be proportionate in terms of uh, what's called, of course, diminishing size. Well, you know they had overlapping because it's self-evident. The Brown, large brown horse overlaps the white or uh, albino bison. The black horses overlap both. I mean, this horse's head overlaps the belly, right, of the brown horse. So overlapping is really the only technique for space that we can clearly identify. That's it in this painting. Is it dynamic? Well, there isn't a straight line anywhere in this painting. It's entirely dynamic. I mean, even the legs of the ho of the big brown horse are out of diagonals, right? So it's it's all yeah. dynamic. If if you said they seem slightly stable because the bottom two thirds is, yeah, I wouldn't take points off. But realistically, diagonal, remember, and curved lines combined, like the tail, for instance. Uh, it it's there are there are no right angles here, that's for sure, or long straight horizontal or vertical lines. So it's you could you safely say it's entirely dynamic. What about rhythm? Oh, absolutely. The horses all have roughly the same shape, even though the brown one's much larger, right? The head, the back, the legs, the, 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 the tails. Uh, and then the horns on the bison and the hair here, the tufts of hair in between the horns. And then the, the uh, antlers of the two reindeers. That's lots of rhythm, plenty of rhythm. Uh, and then what's the largest mass? Well, that's debatable. Is this bison bigger than the horse that it's uh, behind and that the horse is overlapping it. Um, it's hard to say because we don't see the rest of its body. But it, from what we can see, it's, it, you, you'd have to say, and it's up to you. I wouldn't, again, say absolutely 100% clearly uh, the bison. But I would say uh, it's implied the bison's larger, which it could be in real life because they get pretty large, you know. In the prehistoric times, animals, uh, many animals, so species of animals that are still with us were, were much larger. Uh, than they are today. Like mastodons and woolly mammoths, it's forerunners of elephants, much bigger than the modern elephants. But anyway, so you could you could say first largest mass is the bison, then the brown horse, and then it's a close call. Maybe the reindeer here, because the slide cuts it off, so it's probably larger. Then the, the next largest is the uh, three smaller dark or black horses, and then finally the smallest mass is the brown reindeer. Uh, what about color? Well, the color is cool on the off-white because it is off-white. Now, it's, it kind of might look a little bluish or uh, bluish gray to you, but even that gray, remember, and blue are both cool colors. So if you think it's bluish or grayish white or just off-white is what I call it, that, those are cool colors because it's in contrast to the reddish brown of the largest horse and of the reindeer. The brown of this reindeer. Now this is not part of the painting by the way. If you notice that, 
that's uh, chips in the wall that have occurred. Oh. Yeah, there's, there's been damage. And some people think it's vandals taking pieces. You know, I just want to smack people that do things like that. I mean, this is a UNESCO World Heritage Site, one of a few thousand on the planet Earth, and every culture has at least a couple sites, or every country does, that the UN is trying to protect for the whole world to enjoy, right, for the future, right, of oh, future generations. And somebody came along and damaged it. It could just be water damage from moisture seeping in from the, see, there's the, the roof of the cave, by the way. Uh, and that is too. So these colors were all, they, they originally had this, they probably use vegetable dyes, we think, to create that. You don't need to know that. What about simulated texture? And then we, we'll move on here because we want to keep moving. Okay. Yeah. Absolutely. Look how, I think this is the most amazing thing about this and many other cave paintings. Look, anybody has a cat or a dog at home? I have one of each. <laughs> Especially if you've had many, many, many over the years, you know what that's called, nose leather when you scruff them, you know, you kind of uh, tickle them on the nose or whatever, give them a, a pat or something. Uh, they usually like that if you don't do it too rough. <laughs> you know they like it if they don't bite you, right? Anyway, so the, the nose leather is very sophisticated. I mean, this was a skilled artist or group of artists. And look at the tufts of hair and even the rough antlers or horns, I'm sorry, they're horns, on the uh, two protruding horns of this bison. And to me, this looks like horse hair on the body of the brown horse. You don't see it here because these are silhouettes of solid black here and on the black reindeer. But you do see some, I think, hair or, or textures. It actually is pretty amazing, simulated texture. And then last, we're not going to cover all nine elements on all slides, but we will sometimes. With architecture, I usually do that. But um, we do have a time limit, so we're going to move on. But one last other element we didn't yet cover on this. Outline, it's got bold outline, doesn't it? Around most of the objects, even the horse, if you, if you follow here, that, that's, the line kind of fades out, but it's there if you look, right? Around the belly. So whatever outline there is visible is bold. Okay, moving on. This is the next must know. And this one, is there are two terms or two names for this that are very similar. I usually go with the one that Stockstad uses, even sometimes when I disagree with it for reasons that I'll explain, for instance, on this one. But let's keep it simple. So if you're using Stockstad, as you often or, or ought to, I'm sorry, most people do, let's say, uh, for study, for review, uh, as part of the review, we do review in class a bit too, right? But but on the other hand, this this textbook is part of the reason to have Stockstead volume one only, remember, is, is to have images of most. It's like 90% of all these slides are in that book uh, and the text that goes with it to, to, to help review uh, because they don't give you as much meaning. They can't. The textbooks can't get on as much depth as we do in class, but it's a, it sets the context anyway. She calls that is Stockstead this, and here's the title, this next must know, woman, woman from Villendor. Now, Villendorf is with a W because it's a city in Austria where they speak German. So a W is pronounced like a V. I'll spell it. W-I-L-L-E-N-D-O-R-F. One word. W-I-L-L-E-N-D-O-R-F. Willendorf. If you want to say it with a W, that's okay. It doesn't matter. It's, uh, you do need to spell the words that are on the syllabus for the exams, the midterm and the final, correctly if you want full credit. Okay, the location I just mentioned, I'll say it again, Austria. I think everyone knows how to spell Austria, but um, uh, just to be safe, I'll spell it once. Austria, the country, of course, A-U-S-T-R-I-A, -A, where the Van Trapp family came from, from The Sound of Music. Didn't they have a play version of that in uh, the Santa Rosa JC Theater? Right, I, I have students who said they were in that play. Uh, and there's a movie with Julie <laughs> Andrews and about Austria, right, before the Nazis took over. 22,000 BC. Wow, that's old. That's the oldest work of art we're going to see this semester in this class. 22,000 BC or BCE. So what is this? Well, let's start with the fact that if you're looking it up on the internet, and you might want to do that to create flashcards, you don't really have to, because you have an open book test, remember, and you have uh, more than 24 hours to answer the questions after I post the test. Uh, but nonetheless, if you do want to make flashcards, 
uh, you're, you're going to have a harder time finding this under the title Stockstead gives it because 80 or 90% of all historians call it Venus, as in the goddess Venus from Bellendorf. You don't have to write that except now under the meaning you probably should because just say that's the alternate title. Why? Who cares? What does that mean? Venus is another word that historians use for prehistoric and ancient art artifacts, usually sculpture, that depicts either the actual goddess of love that the ancient Greeks called Venus, or it depicts an image of a fertility object. That's the main part of the meaning you should have in your notes. This, every historian agrees. Well, no, not every. I can't say every. They just say most historians agree that this was a fertility object. What does that mean? It means that it had the power, if that is correct, the leading theory is that it's a fertility object, which would mean it's only about five inches tall, by the way. So it could be held in the hand of an adult and grant that adult magic power. So now that's the next term. So we only have three tonight. On your uh, list of terms to know, it's the next one down under prehistoric. Amulet, A-M-U-L-E-T. Well, it's right there in front of you. I shouldn't have to spell it. It's not something you make with three eggs. Not that kind of amulet. A-M-U-L-E-T is an object that can be held in the hand of an adult human being, man or woman. By the way, women could very easily have created this piece and be the ones who used it, but we'll get to what that means in a minute. So uh, let me just say the definition again once slowly. It's an object that can be held in the hand of an adult human being, comma, which grants that person magic powers, period. So what powers could this grant someone if it is a fertility object or a Venus? Those two words are interchangeable in uh, ancient art history. That's why most historians call this the Venus of Villanova. They think that's what it was, a fertility object. Then the purpose was to guarantee uh, a safe, healthy children. And you might think, what? Why do you need magic powers for that? Can anybody, does anybody know how things with the prehistoric times and even in the ancient world, but certainly in prehistoric times, um, what happened with um, infant mortality? Was it just, oh, slightly higher than now? Maybe double what it is now? It depends on what part of the world you're in, but it's usually only about 3%, three, three percent, thank heavens, in lots of places, it's even less, or even 1%. It was one out of three children died, either at birth and sometimes a mother along with them, uh, or within a few uh, weeks after they were born. It, that was an incredible figure. That's what some historians think. They, they don't have a census. No one took censuses back then. But there's some evidence for that. It was very, just write it this way in your notes. It was a very high mortality, uh, sorry, mortality, infant mortality rate. Some historians believe up to one out of three children were, were either uh, dead at birth or shortly afterwards. And often the mother would die with them in childbirth. So it wasn't a given or an easy thing. So that meant magic powers could help. So what would happen? A shaman, in this case, more likely a woman than a man in my estimation. No, some historians don't think that. Could be either a man or a woman. A shaman uh, would have had this object with them, with him and her, and showed up in the, well, probably cave, what else would it be, of the couple where the woman was about to give birth and say whatever magic chant or prayer or song, whatever ritual, you could just say ritual, any magical ritual they believe would guarantee safe, healthy childbirth for both the mother and the newborn. So some people also think that it was used during conception and that would guarantee, you know, a successful pregnancy for that couple. So probably both. Most historians think it was used both at the beginning of the process of procreation for human procreation uh, and, and then toward the end. Um, but we don't know. There's no written records. So what's the other theory? And this one has more people subscribing to it than the minority theory for the K painting which I've only ever heard Sister Wendy and one or two other people say that that wasn't a hunting ritual painting, mostly. Uh, but this one, there is a debate. Just say there is a debate and more and more some historians, not a majority, but more historians every uh, year or so have written articles, several articles have been written about this. Just say more historians beginning to say that this wasn't even a fertility object. It was an actual human 
female portrait because you can see that there are exaggerated reproductive right parts like the breasts right and the vagina is visible obviously uh and then you see they're de-emphasizing the arms you can't some people don't even notice that there are actual arms here look at these tiny little spindly arms uh and then the legs are also you know shorter than they would be in a normal human being of adult human but my my uh question is well then if it's a portrait why is there not a single hint of any human recognizable features in the head not just the face the whole head there's no ears there's no indentations to indicate placement of ears eyes mouth nose i find that theory questionable but it's possible that it was a portrait of you know perhaps a, just a pregnant woman a prominent person maybe the you know mate right they didn't have formal marriage well i guess they sort of did just say mate a uh, partner of the um leading tribe member you know the head guy who usually they were male dominated at that point not always but usually you know who is the greatest hunter and so then he became the chief you want to call him chief or head of the tribe and then maybe his mate was this is a portrait of her it's possible it's also possible it's just a generic portrait there's a third theory of uh, pregnant women in general and it might or might not have been used by priests or priestesses more likely female therefore priestess a priestess uh, or female shaman uh, for guaranteeing uh, you know uh, successful pregnancy and uh, safe healthy childbirth so it could be a combination of all three but i don't think of it as a portrait personally i just there's too many generic things that don't indicate individual personality but it is possible that it's a portrait of some prominent prehistoric female member of that tribe so those are the theories that's all the meaning formal analysis well it is a single mass there's no divide i mean you know you could break up parts of a human body and say the largest mass is her perhaps her midsection right uh, and then uh, maybe it's the the legs and then the breasts and then the head and then the tiny little arms. But that's really getting to, you don't have to get into that kind of, you just say it's a single solid piece of stone. And I'm telling you now, so it's part of the meaning, the mass, it's five inches tall. That's all it is. Okay, what technique for space? Only one overlapping. The arms overlap the breasts. That's about it. There really isn't any other technique for space here or any other use of that technique just on the arms it is a cool grayish color now in some photos it looks almost brownish but i've actually seen a lot of these objects in museums in germany and austria although not maybe this very one they're usually a cool gray color of stone so that would be cool and the texture is mostly real i don't see simulated texture here at all because it's the rough texture of the stone you're seeing and then here, what is that simulating? <laughs> a wool sock cap for, you know, ski country or something? Yeah, that doesn't make it. That's why, again, I don't think it's a portrait. But anyway, that's some kind of a texture. You could say it's supposed to simulate something, but what? It, it, it isn't realistic anyway. So you could just overlook that and say that it's primarily only texture here is the real rough stone. Okay, and then there is carved line that's done quite well there's even little fingers if you look closely you see them here and then of course on that strange geometric pattern on the head and then down between the legs right and the belly button there's carb line uh it is dynamic to a fall i don't see anything stable i mean the closest thing would be the two spindly little arms resting on top of the breast but even there there's curves so i don't see any straight lines so it's basically entirely uh dynamic uh, there is the rhythm of the repeated shapes of the breasts, the legs, the arms. Um, let me see. Dynamic, stable, color, mass. Oh, balance. It's very balanced. It's a, um, you know, a uh, typical adult human body, somewhat exaggerated, yes, but it does have all the body parts in the right places, right? Even though there's no face, there is a head. And everything, therefore, balances halfway top to bottom, right? And left to right. So it is balanced. Okay, um, let's go to the next one. Of course, any questions you have at any time, please feel free. This is another version, not the one that's in uh, the text. Well, it depends on which edition of Stockstead. It might be in some other editions. 
the ones I use to create the course anyway, and the ones that you need to know for the exam are just the images that I tell you when I say it's must know. But this is another Venus, another or fertility object uh, or different possible portrait. Okay, this is the next must know. And uh, it's the third one on your list for tonight. And this is called Bison, one word, very easy to remember, a single word title, B-I-S-O-N, Bison. The location is France. And the date, little c, you can ignore the little c, but if you know your history, many of you must know this from past history class, that means we don't know the even the exact century. We have a rough idea, an approximate. C is Italian, short for circa, which in Italian means about or around. So you can ignore that on the exam or even on your papers. You, you don't have to write the little c. So you could just say 13,000 BC or BCE. So this is another prehistoric work, of course. By definition, it would be prehistoric because of the date in Europe at that time, no one was keeping written records that far back. So what are we looking at? We're looking at another amulet. Well, there's some debate on that. And so I'm gonna say a possible amulet, an object to guarantee again, a successful hunt of what? Of a bison. You could say bull if you want to, because that's the title of the first slide tonight. Even though it's not accurate, um, biologically they call it either that white bison a bull or this one. But if you want to say bull, I wouldn't take points off. So, so bison or bull. Okay, it could be that. It could be a hunting ritual object. But now there's another kind of amulet. All right. Uh, well, then it means, yes, it's, it's, it's small enough to fit in the hand of the person carrying it. And it's only four and a half inches. So, you know, you'd have to grip it pretty tightly, but you can get it in a single adult human being's hand. So maybe it is, that's one of the theories about the meaning, a carving of a bull or bison intended to grant special powers by that tribe or a hunter, perhaps even the hunter themselves might have taken it with them, uh, but then they needed both hands to hunt the animal. So I don't know what, maybe uh, around it, their neck or something, or tucked into a belt. Yes, they had belts that far back. They, they know how to make belts without buckles, obviously. <laughs> But the point is you could carry this with you if you were a hunter or, or you could just have the holy man, probably a man that far back, uh, accompany the hunters and, and he, or if it was a woman, she could, could carry this with them to guarantee a successful hunt. That, that's a leading theory. But in this one, I take the less common theory. I believe in that, which is look at what's happening with this animal. Look closely now at the detail here of the face, the ex there's even a, an emotion a bit expressed here. The animal is licking something, an irritation or a wound. It's either being, you know, it's either irritated or injured by some kind of, you know, uh, effect or, or just say perhaps something happening to it on its skin, on the surface of its hide. And it's responding to that where the arrow is. So what that tells me, and many historians believe this, is this could just be a portrait that an artist carved of a particular bison that, uh, it could have been a female artist, but just to say he probably or she, could have seen one day out on the plains or wherever they were in Europe, is probably uh, somewhere in Southern uh, France. So they would have seen these animals roaming in the countryside in you know the flat lands, not in the mountains, right? of, of uh, southern France. And so maybe the artist, whoever it was, just was moved or touched by the suffering or, uh, you know, pain even uh, of this animal and tried to capture the personality of the animal at that moment. That's, that is a theory that's not totally without merit, but there's no, again, no way to know for sure because we don't have any written records. So it could be a portrait of an animal in a moment of pain or discomfort. And it could, therefore, if that's the case, the artist is showing empathy or sympathy for the animal's discomfort. But the leading theory is still that it's another hunting ritual object or amulet. Okay, it's a piece of bone. 
I don't think I said that, did I? I should have. It's carved out of a single piece of bone. If you look closely, I think you can tell that. That it was probably found in this shape. It doesn't look like it had to be carved, the outer edge of it, but it could have been. It's possible it was carved out of a larger piece. In any case, it's carved, obviously, so let's do the formal analysis. Uh, with the uh, details are sharp and very realistic on the horns, the eyes, and even the eyelid. There's that nose leather again, the hair, right, under the chin and above the eyes along the snout. And then it's less detailed here because this is the actual texture. No, similar texture is, is created with carve line in the entire head and neck. But there is more just the real uh, rough texture of the bone on the rest of it. It's a cool color. Yeah, it veers towards a little bit of hints of pink, depending on which image you, I mean, how your computer, I'm sorry, I meant to say, <laughs> is projecting this image on your screen. Uh, but I've, I've seen many of these and they're almost always, you know, the color of a cool gray. Well, this one is anyway. But if you said it has a pinkish or warm cast to it, I wouldn't take points off. Again, that's why I said I'll give you some flexibility or leeway about what, how you see things. If you don't see them exactly the way I do, I'm not going to take points off as long as you explain what you see. All right, is there a rhythm? Well, yeah, there are the, what's well, supposed to be groups, you know, pairs of legs, two sets of legs. And of course, the hair on the head all the way down to the chin and uh, the two horns. Now, you don't see both eyes, but they're implied, of course. So there's rhythm and it is dynamic. There's no straight lines in it. Not really, not even on the hair. Um, and then we have only overlapping for space. The head overlaps the body, and you could say the tongue overlaps the skin where it's licking itself. Uh, and the largest mass, it's a single mass. I think it's roughly balanced. If you drew a line this way, you would be able to measure the, the, the it's only four and a half inches long. So you could say it's only about, um, actually this piece is, yeah, right, more like four inches, uh, maybe two inches from here to here. But if you added that up, and then this area, because it's larger in the leg and, and uh, um, haunches of the, of the animal, it's roughly balanced. I think left to right, but if you don't see it that way and you think it's weighted or unbalanced more toward the left, I, I wouldn't argue with you. Depends on where you draw the line. And for top to bottom, I think you can say it's, it's roughly balanced. But again, some people might think, well, again, where do you draw that line if it's down here or up this far, I mean? then you might think this has more weight. So I leave that to you. Okay, and then uh, let's see, texture, color, rhythm, balance, it's all one mass. All right, now we get to a work that I go ahead and give you a heads up, you probably can guess is, is so important, I'm not gonna cut it from the study list. I should have said that with the cave painting. I will apologize to you. I'm gonna try to always remember, I almost always do. When a slide is so important to the history of that topic that we're covering in any given lecture that I don't intend, will not cut it for sure from the study list, I'll tell you that usually. So at the beginning, normally you can say it. So I don't know if you want to use a little star or check or X or something next to the notes for those slides, because we'll cut many of the others that aren't in that subcategory. But I'm going to tell you the two tonight that are so important that they definitely are not being removed from your midterm study list. I'm not saying either one or both, but the odds are very high one of them will be on the midterm. Are the first slide, right? The uh, Hollables, and then this next one, Stonehenge. We're gonna take some time on this a little bit. Before before we start on this, um, can I yes. just ask the uh, the bison sure. was, right. it was in France, and I'm sorry, what year was it? Oh. It 13, sure, 13,000 BC or BCE. Okay. Thank All right, you. we're doing fine on the time here. We'll, we'll end about 9.45. That's, most nights will end between 9.35 and 9.45, but it depends on how many questions. And then I'll stick around, hopefully not too many minutes, but as long as there are questions afterwards, and of course, some of you will want to sign off right away after the end of this, but do pay attention to this slide. Okay, we're looking at Stonehenge which is one word, I think you all know, it's like the word stone, H-E-N-G-E, -E, Stonehenge. And yes, you do need to know if you wanna get full credit if it's on the midterm, the location includes the, the town. Salisbury, yes, there's a stake, it's named after. The stake comes from that part of England and that's the same spelling, S-A-L-I-S-B-U-R-Y. 
Everyone knows how to spell England. Then the date, little c means we don't have an exact year again. You can just write 2000 BC. Okay, what is Stonehenge? It's a prehistoric site built by the Britons. That's with a capital B, and yes, it's T-O-N-S, by the way. That's how the name of the country today, it's called Great Britain. That's where they got the name. Don't write that it was built by Druids. That's a modern term that is mostly mythical. There are modern Druids in England. They're a cult. They're harmless. They don't hurt anybody. Unlike some cults, uh, they tend to be, you know, uh, just people who worship, you know, prehistoric things. And they do get the permission to have a sunrise ceremony every year here, by the way. You may have heard of that. Every year on the first day of summer. We'll talk about that in a minute. But let's talk about the overall meaning of it. Okay, it's a prehistoric site in southern England that was built by a tribe called the Britons, forerunners of the modern nation, right? And we don't know for sure why they built it, so there are three leading theories. The first one, let's see, there we go. See, I have several images of it, is that at least part of the site was used as a... Uh, ritual burial site for leading members of that tribe, the tribe that built it. Once again, that the uh, first maybe purpose of part of the site is that it was used as a ritual burial site for leading members of that, that tribe. We now know that's true because this outer row, see there's only little tiny bits of the stones left except for this one that fell over and this one that fell over. These are the only two uh, fairly intact stones, but they're not upright. On the outer circle, we know now there is evidence that they use this as burial sites. Don't write bones. No bones would survive that long. 4,000 years or more. No, there's no bones left. But we can tell from the objects found that there was at some time in the past, and maybe some even bits of clothing, that there had been burials there. So just say that now scientists know that that's, that at least is true. What are the other main theories? So here we go. I'm going to do this uh, for all of you each time I have multiple images. That's the view that we'll have on the exam. I think you'll agree it's the most complete view, or not the most complete, the most detailed view. The only trouble is you can't see the outer circle, except for that, the one actual stone that is standing is called the heel stone. So I'm going to, if it's on the exam, this is the view you'll have, okay? Because it's the most common view and it's the best slide I have. Okay, I didn't take this, I'd have to have a helicopter. You'll see my slides in a couple minutes. Okay, so what are the other two? There are three leading theories about the purposes for why these circles of stone. I didn't say this, but if you can't tell by looking, maybe you wanna write it. It consists, Stonehenge, of three concentric circles of stones built at different times. Obviously, you all know what concentric means, so we see only a few remnants of the outer circle where we know they used it for burial for uh, leading members of the tribe, where the arrow is. Then there are two inner circles. So what could those have been used for? The uh, other two leading theories are that it was used as an astronomical observatory. Absolutely, now we almost 100% sure that's true because in the last several decades even, been a while since the first evidence. We know the sun for thousands of years has risen. Oh, see where the arrow is? That's called the heel stone. Has risen on the first day of summer every year without fail. Shines right over that stone between these two and onto what would have been the altar. You see it's fallen down, but it would have been in the middle. That's not a coincidence. Well, it could be, but it's highly unlikely. That just happens to work out that way every year without the So why would that have mattered? Because these people, it's part of the meaning now, they had farming and they needed to know when to plant and when to sow their fields, when to harvest, right? And when to leave them fallow. So they needed to know the seasons as they came. In England, the, the weather is, you know, pretty intense. So uh, they, they would want to measure the different seasons. That's a very common theory. There's no proof of it, again, because there's no written records, but it's very likely. We do know, though, there's no theorizing to that, that the fact is the sun always every year, the first day of summer, that's exactly, it's called summer solstice, rises right between, you know, over that stone, between these two, and hits the center, what would have been the altar. The third theory is that the whole site, the entire site, especially the two inner circles, was used as an outdoor religious ritual center or site. 
also makes sense. In fact, now most historians, I, I would include myself, believe it's all three, that at different times this site was used for all three of those purposes. But we don't actually know for sure if any one was the dominant purpose. We doubt it was just built for fun, <laughs> just out of boredom, because these people were fighting for survival. Well, here are the other facts we can say for sure, and then I'll tell you two or three myths before we wrap it up with formal analysis. Okay, one is that the stones in the middle are called, I'm sorry, reach, sorry, I meant to say reach the height, the tallest, just say the tallest stones, these two sets, that these are actually these three these three sets, are about 22 feet high. I mean, think how far back this is. They had no cranes. The average height of an adult male was like 5'2", and women were about 4'10". So that is an amazing thing. This is three or four times as tall as the, the average adult. How they got them here is another mystery, not just how big the stones are and how could they have carved them and erected them. That's a mystery. We don't know how. We also don't know how they got them here. They come from over 200 miles away in Wales. If you look at a map, you know, that's at the very farthest edge of the British Isles. Well, if you count Ireland, it's not, but uh, of the main island there, right? Wales is 200 miles. The mountains from which they could have taken them are about 200 miles away. So we, they had no wheels. They had farming. They didn't have wheels. They didn't have chariots or carts like the Egyptians already did. The Egyptians were way ahead of these people at this point in time. And that's one of the theories. How did they build this? Well, the Egyptians, or maybe later the ancient Greeks, sent engineers to help them. <laughs> I think we know. The records on both ancient Egyptian history and ancient Greek are very well kept. We don't know every detail, but something as important as traveling over a thousand miles away across several you know, seas and oceans, all the way around France, onto the Atlantic, and then into the... Of course, there'd be a record of that in ancient Egypt or ancient Greece. It's a silly theory. There's absolutely no evidence for that, but that is one theory of how they built it. Another is, yes, you may have heard Merlin, the magician. Never mind that he, if he ever, he didn't exist. But if he had existed, the whole thing was King Arthur. That's 500 AD or, or uh, CE. That's thousands of years later. And plus which we know there's no such person as Mer Merlin. He used his wand to, I've actually read that in books. <laughs> the, the, some of the, the people I talked about that cult, the uh, Druids in England believe that. Not very credible. Okay, but we do know that these stones, and this is the last new definition for tonight, have a, a, a name, the technique for construction, and it's on your syllabus, I mean on your, sorry, list of terms, monoliths and lintels, very easy to remember. It's a method of construction used at Stonehenge, comma, in which the upright stones are monoliths and the horizontal stones are lintels. There's no other way to say it. Monos and lintels is the first form of architecture known to the human race. Every ancient or prehistoric, sorry, I should say prehistoric culture that built structures, some choose not to. They're nomadic and they had no reason to build like the Plains Indians. Uh, but of course the Indians on the East Coast built very amazing buildings, right? And the ones in the Pueblos, well, you know that. Uh, so they use this method. It's the oldest form of architecture known to the human race. It's universal. Monolith. Um, want me to repeat that? Yes, please. Yeah. Okay. Uh, that that phrase is you have it on your syllabus, your uh, list. So I'll just say the definition. It's the method of construction used at Stonehenge, comma, in which the upright stones are called monoliths, and the horizontal stones, right, are called lintels. It is the main form of architectural construction known to the first site, the first form known to the human race. Okay, and then there is one other aspect of it uh, that I think is, is fairly important. And you don't have to have seen the movie Spinal Tap. You may ever see that. <laughs> oh, nobody does. Where they do a scene on the stage with a miniature version of this and it gets crushed by uh, the dancers. Anyway, the point is these stones weigh two to four tons, depending on which ones you're talking about. So the mystery is even multiplied by that. And so right now, the last fact about the meaning you should write is that it is a, uh, a UNESCO World Heritage, oh, absolutely this is, a U World Heritage site that's protected by the government of Britain and they don't allow people to uh, get up close. Anybody here been to Stonehenge? Anybody in my this class tonight? 
Anybody? No. I have. Oh, when were you there? A long time ago, because I'm old now. Can I ask a question about the monolith? Yes. Um, so we're not, when I studied Stockstad a million years ago, mm -hmm. it, we, we called it post and lentil architecture. Are we not referring to it that way? Yeah. Excellent question. Everybody hear that? Thank you. I, I often just say that anyway, but I thought I'd keep it simple because it's getting late. But you know what? That is the other way of saying it. Post and lintel. Yeah. Because, for example, that's a better way of describing the structures in, say, a, um, a castle a doorway, say, leading into a temple or a castle, because usually there is a post that's, you know, like almost like kind of flat versions of columns on either side of a large, wide doorway. And then the lintel is always the piece across the top. So, yeah, you're right. You, you, you could say post and lintel. Uh, or when I went to Stonehenge, because I'm so old, we, I walked all over it. Isn't that, that's fun, isn't it? Yeah, I yeah, love it. You're so. going to see my slides in just a couple of minutes. Yeah. yeah. And maybe you'll have something to say, because I'll end with just like a three or four minute summary, you know, and uh, that'll be um, uh, what it looks like while I show you those, you know, maybe a dozen slides of how it looks to get up close. When I was there, you could still do that. Uh, and something that happened to me when I spent the night at Stonehenge. I'll get to that at the very end. Okay, let's do the formal analysis. It's balanced and it's not. Of course, originally it was completely balanced. The concentric circles of stone, by definition, would mean they form circles. And they were, you know, not full circles in solid circle form, but obviously, you see, look how much is preserved of this section. Uh, so they formed, you know, balanced, right, shapes, circles. Okay. And then we have Elena. My daughter's asking something. Wait, just a second. Yeah, I'm in the middle of finishing up. Almost done. Yeah, <laughs> you may meet her at some point. Anyway, she's she's uh, all freaked out about the Zoom thing that happened. I told you about that at the beginning tonight. Anyway, so we've been lucky. Let's wrap it up on the formal elements. All right, color. It's cool. They're they're cool. Uh, when you were there, moss and lichen was growing already on them because I actually went back in two thousand four when they started closing it off, and I couldn't get close. My slides are from earlier that you're going to see in about three minutes. But uh, the point is that. Uh, the, the actual natural color of the stone is cool, cool gray. And it's the real, no semi texture, a rough texture of the stone. I think they're granite. I believe that. Anyway, it doesn't matter what kind of stone. They're rough, real textures. Uh, and then we have the rhythm, of course, the two circles, but each individual monolith and lintel are roughly the same shape. Now for space, it's three open concentric circles. Most of the outer circle is gone, but the two inner circles have enough detail for us to define the individual features, which are 20, roughly 22 foot high groups of stone in the inner circle, what's left of it. And then in the middle circle, this would have been the middle circle, these are 18 feet tall. Even these relatively shorter ones, you can see they're not as tall. See the difference? in the height there. So we have 18 feet. It's a rough, they're not exactly the same, but very close, amazingly close for this far back in height. The middle circle reached to the top of the lintel, roughly an 18 foot height. And so that's part of the space, the measurements of the dimensions. Remember a building or structure, this is a structure, right? Not a building. It, it's all about the dimensions or size of the structures. And then what about mass? Well, that should be easy. It should be easy. The largest mass are the largest um, monoliths. And then the next largest math masses are the uh, so, you know, smaller monoliths. And then third, you can do this, I'm sure, on your own by now, I hope. The third largest masses would be the inner circle or larger uh, uh, lentils. And the fourth largest are the smaller lentils. In that order, there's no debating on that. And uh, is it dynamic or stable? Each individual stone, when it was complete, you see how this one looks like it's still got sharp edges um, and some of the others uh, would have been roughly stable. And they weren't really round edged stones, they, but now they've worn down like that. And of course, then it's stable and dynamic because obviously the overall shape is circular, okay? And is there any line here? Only visual line. You see where the sun? creates the shadows, and that's where the modeling is. The shadows from the sun create the effect of modeling. There's no technique for modeling, it's natural modeling. And then there are the visual lines formed by the shadows. Okay, so let's now take just three or four minutes and we'll wrap it up. And, uh, oh, I forgot I had this view. 
I'm going to show you. Now that's an old black and white when people could walk close, but uh, these are some of my own slides. Did you take any while you were there? I'm sorry, I don't know who that was. It was uh, the reason I'm asking is you could get extra credit for that if you wanted to send me images. So here it is from the hillside, from a far enough away view that you almost could think you're in the ancient or prehistoric world as you walked up to it, back when you could still get up close. And you can see here's somebody standing right there next to the uh, middle circle here, the 18 foot high monolith. Okay, so when I was there, I was a young, foolish 19 year old hitchhiking through Europe. It was my last night in Europe. I had run through all my money and I had not barely enough money to buy food and hitchhike back to London. This is about 60 miles from London. And so I had a flight the next evening from London, but I had to go see Stonehenge. So I hitchhiked out there. I was lucky back then that was safe to hitchhike in Europe, at least in England. And people were friendly enough that they didn't, even though I look like Charles Manson, <laughs> that's what they told me. Nonetheless, I got picked up, got rides. People were friendly. So I decided I had a sleeping bag, of course, with me. I was going to spend the night, my last night in, you know, Great Britain, sleeping in the outer ditch. Uh, these are slides much later. You see how sharp the edges are of Stonehenge. Why? Because I wanted the experience of, of watching the sun rise over the heel stone. So I slept near that heel stone. And I somehow managed to sneak into the ditch to where the uh, closing guards couldn't see me. I didn't touch anything. I would never do that. I wouldn't harm anything. I was there out of respect. But that's not how the guard who opened up in the morning thought. He came and woke me up before I was even, you know, out of a deep sleep with a blast of his uh, whistle in my face. And the guy was about six foot four, six five. That's why they hired him, a security guard, to open up Stonehenge in the morning. He said, What the bleeding, I won't say the words you use, uh, swear words in English slang. What the bleeding blank blank are you doing here? And I tried to explain. I was just there to watch the sunrise. He finally was convinced when I begged and pleaded that I had. And I showed him my backpack and my, he could say I hadn't taken anything. So he said, where are you from? I said, Berkeley. You mean Barkley. That's how they pronounce Berkeley there. You mean you're a university student and you didn't know this was against the law? I said, well, I, I, not really. I didn't see any signs. So he grabbed me. Well, that's someone else's slide. You can see that. By the elbow, dragged me all the way through these stones back to the entrance where the gate was locked because he hadn't opened up yet. It was way before it's like sunrise, right? Um, about 6 a.m. in the morning. And he pointed to a sign that said, uh, no trespassing violators will be punished uh, by a fine of 1,500 pounds. That was $3,000. I'd spent, this is more than I spent on my entire trip for three months in Europe. And or six months in jail. So he told me, you go back to Barclay, tell your fellow students or wherever you meet anyone from your country, just don't do what you did and I'll let you go. He let me go. So obviously, right, I would have spent the next six months in jail. So these are the details. Aren't they amazing when you really look at them up close? Yeah. And of course, you cannot get this close anymore. But I thought you might enjoy seeing some of these. And the perfection of the edges, the sharp edges. Uh, and what kind of tools they use, we don't even know for sure. Uh, we just know they didn't have hard metal tools. That's why they call this, uh, some people call it the Stone Age, but by this time, most the historians out consider this more the Bronze Age. They had weapons. They had, uh, you know, shields and swords. So they had some kind of weapons. So look how tall that central stone is. The tallest of all of the central ones. Uh, this probably reached more like 24 or 25 feet. And you can see how people can walk around then. And then there's a view how the sun might have shown through these circles, two circles of stone toward the middle. Okay, so that's it for tonight, but I will stick around if anyone has questions. Let's leave it on this image about anything we've covered um, or anything about, you know, the procedural aspects, as long as it's not something I already answered earlier tonight. But uh, again, if you don't have all of the handouts, you, you should email me at the markw at aol.com by tomorrow, by noon tomorrow, and I can get them to you tomorrow afternoon. But hopefully everyone has the handouts and you'll be getting to, uh, another uh, handout, which will be a sample paper to read. Please read that. I will give you an email to go with it before the next class and then have the five requirements for your short papers, that handout with you. And we'll cover that at the beginning of class. Won't need to use the whiteboard. We'll be able to do that pretty, pretty quickly, um, you know, and, and answer all your questions. And then we'll go into art of the ancient Near East, which is fascinating. Babylon, 
and uh, Syria and uh, the ancient Middle East cultures, which were on the edge of what now we call the Middle East up to the border of Egypt. In two weeks of the night, we'll do ancient Egypt. Okay, anybody have any questions before we sign off? Nope. Okay, well, thank you all. I really appreciate your interest and comments and, and questions and, and your mini bios. Don't forget those if you haven't sent them in. And extra credit, you can do any time, any work of art that uh, you see an article about or your own art, you get five points for that plus the other options. All right, see you all next week. Take care. <laughs> Bye. Bye. I, have, I have a question. Do we okay. have any work? Yeah, just reading from the syllabus. That's all. At this point, each week you have like one chapter of Stockstead and two short chapters of Gill. And those are short. They really are short. So you look. Oh, okay. That's it. Yeah. Until, until we get uh, to the first paper, which is five weeks from tonight. Okay. Is that it? Anybody else? All right. Thank you all. Have a good week. Stay safe. All right. Bye. <laughs> Oh, you have a question? Nope. Oh, yeah. Do you have a question? Uh, nope. All right, good. Yeah. Thank you for your mini bio, by the way. Yeah. Of course. Have a great night. You too. Okay. Thanks. <laughs>